We are live. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the August 11th work session of the East Hampton Town Board. Carol, would you please read the roll call? Councilwoman Burke Gonzalez. Present. Councilman Lease. Present. Councilwoman Overby. Here. Councilman Bragman. Here. Supervisor Van Skoyak. Present. Please join me in saying the Pledge of Allegiance. <clears throat> I pledge allegiance, allegiance to the flag of the flag flag United States of America, America, America to the republic of which, of which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, liberty, justice for all. This morning's meeting will start with a public portion where any member of the public may address the board on any topic. And then we'll move on to our work session agenda topic items, which include the 2019 financial reports, uh, AAA bond rating. We have Naraki Smith and the finance department with us today to uh, go over all of that. Um, Councilman Lease will be presenting parking restrictions proposed at the Amaganza Municipal Parking Field. And uh, I will bring up the topic of stop sign at Berryman and Middle Highway, followed by liaison reports and resolutions. But before we take public comment, I'd just like to give a brief update as the status um, with uh, COVID uh, throughout the county, uh, testing of the last four days uh, from the 8th, I'm sorry, from the 6th of August through the 9th, those four days averaged uh, 54 new positives per day of COVID, um, which is a 1% rate of those tests given for each of those days. Um, the average number of tests was 5,504. Uh, for a total of those four days of 22,000 tests. So again, 1% of uh, those tested uh, were positive. And uh, just for perspective, uh, over those four days, that would be 214 people out of a population of 1.48 million. It's 0.00014% of the population. Uh, while these are really good numbers, and I have to say I'm extremely proud, particularly of our citizens here in East Hampton for keeping our rate the second lowest of any township within the New York metropolitan Long Island area, second only to Shelter Island. We need to continue to be vigilant and wear masks, and we ask that you follow all the safety protocols uh, regarding COVID. And uh, without any further ado, I'd like to move on to the public portion and bring on any callers that we have. The, the number to call in uh, will be on your screen, and that's 351-888-6331. Uh, believe it's up on the on the crawler there. Michael, do we have any callers at this point? We do not have any current callers on the line. Okay, so if we have any callers call in, I'll try to bring them in in between our work session uh, topics. Um, at this point, I'd like to introduce Dave Tellier from Iraqi Smith. Uh, to give us the 2019 financial reports. We ask Dave to come live. Thank, thank you. Good morning, gentlemen. Good morning. Thank you. So we appreciate the, uh, the town uh, asking us to present the results of the 2019 audit to, uh, to you the, today. So, so thank you. Um, we provided you with a brief presentation. I don't know if you have it, but I will walk you through it. Um, as, as we go along, uh, we'll try to be brief, but just highlight some of the, the main topics that we see uh, that's contained within the financial statements. And, uh, and then we'll open it up to any questions that any, uh, any of the board members may have for us. Um, with me is also Craig Hauser, uh, who was the supervisor on the engagement. So, uh, so this way, if you do have any questions, he, either uh, Craig or myself should be able to answer them uh, today for you. So first is, uh, Naraki Smith was contracted by the town to perform an audit of the general purpose financial statements for the year ended uh, December 31st, 2019. We also assisted um, in the preparation of the comprehensive annual fiscal report or the CAFR, which is submitted to the Government Finance Officers Association um, in accordance with the Achievement in Excellence Award Program. The town has received this award for a number of years now, um, and we consider this uh, financial statement for the 2019 to meet all of the uh, criteria to receive that award uh, again this year. We also performed a single audit of the federal award programs in accordance with the OMB uh, compliance supplement. 
we performed a, a, an audit on the Department of Transportation, a state single audit, as well as the Justice Court for the town of East Hampton. Um, we also issued a management letter presenting uh, findings and recommendations on improving uh, accounting procedures or internal controls. Um, before I get into any of the numbers, we did want to you know, say that in our review of the the financial records for the for, for the current fiscal year again we found no material weaknesses or significant deficiencies in the internal control structure as well as we had no current year findings or recommendations or suggestions on improving as well so uh we were very happy in which uh the records are maintained and the internal controls are operating there at the town so we want to make sure we we thought it would be nice to start off with that <laughs> going going through the presentation um, the next part is just talking a little bit at the, about the audit conduct uh, of our field work when we started. I'm going to turn that over to Craig to let him give you a, a brief uh, understanding of how we conducted our, our, our audit field work this year, uh, obviously with, uh, with the pandemic that hit right before we were going to do our field work. So I'll let Craig kind of take that over. Good morning. Um, so we were able to start our audit on time. Uh, we commenced the audit beginning April 27th uh, with the finance department. Charlene Cagle and Len Bernard and their team were able to help us out immensely with everything going on. Uh, we were able to more or less conduct the audit completely remotely. Uh, my team and I were gained access to the Munis system where we could access mostly everything that we wanted to if we had any restrictions that we weren't allowed to dealing with payroll or any uh, personal information, we had to go through Charlene. Uh, so if there were restrictions and internal controls that we'd like to see there. Uh, we were able to combine most of our field work by making most of our picks through the Munis system. And we had, I believe, two or three days where my team went on site um, for any of the large invoices that we had to see. Uh, Charlene's done an amazing job where all the receipts are now scanned into the system. So that allowed us to basically see everything we wanted to see on the revenue side. On the expense side, we had to go into the field um, just because some of those invoices and purchase orders tend to be very large packages but um, we were able to complete our audit in a better part of a month by May 22nd we more or less had everything done uh, field work wise and we um, were able to have a draft of the financial statements um, not counting the housing authority uh, by the end of June so we were ready and on time and uh, we were able to review with Len and Charlene um, finding no mistakes, uh, not many changes. And as Dave mentioned before, uh, we went through our internal controls as we do every year, and we had no material weaknesses or significant deficiencies in internal control. Great, thank you, Craig. Um, so just to give you a brief overview of the financial statements, um, again, the financial statements for the town is about 140 pages thick, so I'm gonna try to kind of condense that in a brief five minute overview. Please, please um, summarize. <laughs> yes. Um, so I'll kind of just walk you through it, just the layout of the financial statements. We feel that that's the easiest way to kind of uh, kind of go through it with you. So the opening section of your financial statements, it's called the introductory section. It's the first 15 pages. This really gives just kind of an overview of the town. It has a town map, the uh, principal officials, an organizational chart. Um, it also has a letter of transmittal to the, to, to the GFOA for that certificate from the supervisor as well. Uh, from the comptroller. So that kind of just opens up the financial statements with a good uh, preview of, of the things to come. Then it goes into the actual financial statements of which there are two sets of financial statements within the audit report. The first is your government-wide financial statements. These are on the full accrual basis of accounting. So this is, uh, you would look at these financial statements kind of as you would look at any entity where it has all of your, uh, all of your assets, your fixed assets, all of your debt, everything is all consolidated into one financial statement. So for the town, at the end of the year, you had total assets of just about $684 million. Uh, most of that was primarily consisting of capital assets uh, of about $548 million. You had total liabilities of just under $277 million, of which this was primarily com comprised of two uh, areas. One is your bonds and revenue bonds payable of a little over $90 million and your other post-employment benefit liability for the town as actuarial determined to be $124.4 million. During the current year, the, uh, the town had a new bond issuance of about $21.4 million, as well as uh, a new ban issuance of $16.8 million. 
Uh, this would essentially offset the previous year bond anticipation note or your band payable of a little over $41 million. So we turned some of that prior year short-term debt into long-term debt with that issuance. Um, we did have a bond refunding of about five and a half million dollars, which gave a benefit to the town of just about one hundred and forty thousand dollars to refund uh, to refund that debt. And we did have a restatement to your capital assets uh, and your net assets of a little over eight million dollars. Uh, this was a positive increase, um, and it was a result of a, a full capital asset physical inventory done of all of the assets townwide and uh, and brought uh, brought to, uh, to to top dollar. This overall leaves you with a total net position of just about $407 million at the end of the year, again, on the full accrual basis. So now switching gears. That, that was done, capital asset. That was done during the year 2000. That was done during the current year 2019. So it was done and ready for us at the end of the year to, to go through an audit. And when was the last time that was done? 2012. Yeah, I was going to say it was a long time ago. Thank you very much, Charlene. Appreciate it. So switching to the governmental fund financial statements, uh, which are the traditional uh, financial statements for, for, a, uh, for a local government. These are the fund level statements that are uh, managed on a day-to-day -day basis by the finance department. Uh, and they have a current focus. So it's really the financial statements are looking at what's either gonna be collected or what's coming due within the upcoming year and what can be used to, uh, for that upcoming year's uh, budget and things of that nature. So it's a very strict focus. There are no capital assets. There are no long-term debt obligations, things of that nature. So on your balance sheet, uh, total assets of all your funds sits at $122 million. Uh, the large portion of this is really relating to cash, uh, cash uh, and restricted cash on hand. Your total liability sits at about $26.6 million, of which the lion's share of that is the $16.8 million bond anticipation note that's on the books because that's considered short-term debt which leaves you with total fund balance of all the funds of about $94 million. Your fund balance is broken into four different categories. There is a category of non-spendable, which relates to prepaid items that we made in 2019 that relate to 2020 of about one and a half million dollars. We have $49 million in restricted fund balance. Uh, and the large portion of this is really the community preservation fund that is restricted. Those monies are restricted only for that particular purpose. You have $31.5 million in assigned funds, which are monies that are assigned to the specific purpose within those funds uh, outside of the general fund. And then you have $11.9 million of unassigned fund balance that sits in your general or whole town fund at the end of the year. For the year on an income statement side, you had a net increase in all funds of about $10 million with your total revenues and other source uh, financing sources at about $135.6 million. Slightly decreased from the previous year, but this primarily related to uh, a big reduction in from 2018 to 2019 in your community preservation fund revenues that you received. Uh, your total expenses for the year was $125.2 million. Uh, increased by about $20 million from 2018. And again, this really related to increases in the capital projects that were done in 2019, as well as uh, increased purchases from the previous year relating to community preservation fund. After the financial statements are the notes to the financial statements. Uh, those go on from pages 38 through 70. Uh, the presentation here is consistent with the previous year. Um, we had no new accounting pronouncements or standards that we had to enact this year. So uh, we were very happy about that because it kind of kept the presentation very consistent with the previous year. So um, the only thing here, again, is talking about that restatement, which is on page uh, 69, that talks about uh, the capital uh, asset inventory that was done and the restatement that was needed to get the, uh, the balances where they needed to be. After the notes, there are certain required supplementary schedules uh, that are required by the Governmental Accounting Standards Board or by GASB. Those primarily are budget versus actual schedules for all of your major funds. Um, and then certain schedules relating to the other post-employment benefits for the town, as well as the share of the pension liabilities for the New York State Employee Retirement System, as well as the New York State Police and Fire Retirement System that uh, is the town's uh, percentage relating to those uh, pension plans. After that, we have some other supplementary information, 
uh, relating to uh, the combining schedules of all what, what are deemed non-major funds that consolidate up into the main financials of the town, as well as budget and actual schedules for all of the remaining funds that were not major funds at that time. Uh, again, both of these areas, all of the schedules that are contained in here were here in the previous year. So this is consistent with the previous year's presentation, nothing new to, uh, to highlight here for you. And then the financial statements end with what's deemed the statistical section. This is, uh, this is one of the sections that's required uh, for the, uh, that the Government Finance Officers Association Award for uh, Excellence in Financial Reporting. So we have about 18 pages relating to various st uh, statistical information uh, on the financial trends, debt capacity, demographics, and things of that nature relating to the town. What's nice in these uh, in this section is that it actually gives you information for uh, normally up to the last 10 years of information for the town, uh, where most of the financial statements is really on a single year presentation. There is no, there really is no comparative information within the financial statements until you get to, to this area. So it is a very good uh, section to look at for some trend analysis of the town and where it's, where it's been going for the last 10 years. Um, but again, the, uh, the makeup of those uh, schedules are identical to the previous years just rolled forward. So nothing new to, uh, to alert you to in this regard. And that's really it. That was kind of just like quick, again, a quick overview of that big document of the financial statements. Um, we tried to give you some of the highlights to it. Um, what's nice is not a lot changed. Next year, there will be some new standards that are going to be implemented. So we'll walk you through that and the changes that will uh, be implemented uh, for that. But this year was, was nice to get a reprieve from that and actually uh, be able to just uh, roll the financial statements forward. Thank you very much for that, Dave. And we certainly appreciate your hard work along with Craig in uh, reviewing the town's finances and helping us prepare the CAFR. Um, you know, we're, we're very fortunate in East Hampton. We've had, we had a really solid financial team for a number of years now. Um, Charlene Cagle's past president of the GFOA, the Governor of Fi Government Finance Officers Association. Uh, and we've been, uh, you know, I think very lucky to have her and Lynn Bernard, our budget officer, um, who have consistently helped guide the town's finances uh, from uh, post-financial crisis to where we are now. Uh, I'll make a note that uh, March of 2021 will be the final payments of the deficit uh, financing. Um, and during this time of deficit finance payments, we've been able to set aside significant surpluses and build back the reserves of the town uh, through the consistent uh, and careful budgeting process. Um, I, I want to thank the town board members for supporting my budgets and uh, for being conservative in the way that we spend the taxpayers' dollars uh, in providing what are valuable services to our community. Um, and, um, you know, I think this trend. Uh, <laughs> Uh, is has continued and it's um, resulted in CAFR uh, certificate awards of achievement for financial reporting from years 2013 through 2018. We're now submitting for 2019. That is in no small part to uh, our excellent staff, Charlene Cagle and, and Len Bernard. And I just want to take an opportunity to thank them on behalf of the town board and the community for really outstanding work. And in all those in the finance uh, department who've worked really hard on this. Um, you know, we, we have a bond sale today. Um, we've received a, a reaffirmation of the Moody's AAA bond rating again for this year. Uh, so we've consistently held the highest bond rating since 2017. Um, so I think that in conjunction with the reports that you're giving here and the status of the town's finances are quite strong, especially at this time of uh, na uh, international pandemic, uh, the town and its finances have, have remained solid. And you know, one of the reasons that we've worked hard to establish significant reserves is to be able to buffer the impacts of crises that might occur. And you know, we we really focus more on uh, a major hurricane being that that crisis, but obviously uh, that's not what's happened. And we've been able to quickly and efficiently address issues that have arisen during the COVID pandemic uh, because of our financial strength. And, uh, you know, we still in any given year could 
suffer a significant hurricane. So again, having those reserves in place are important. Um, do you have anything else uh, that you'd like to add or any questions from board members at this time? I was just gonna ask if Charlene or Len had any comments that they wanted to make. Uh, well, I, I, one of the things that Peter just um, touched on was that AAA credit rating, which is something that we work very hard uh, to, uh, to get to. And I want to thank Dave and his staff. Dave, Dave, is, Dave and Naraki have been part of the team uh, that has led the town back from, you know, from its financial woes back in 2008 and 9. They've been here the, the entire 10 years, so I want to thank them. Um, you, you know, they, we did go out and, and, and did an RFP to see if we wanted to change auditors, but it, it, as it turned out, you know, based on the responses we got, we stayed with Naraki. They've been integral in, in, in us getting where we are today. They've worked with us, the controller's office, so I want to thank them. And that AAA rating kind of was, you know, that was kind of like the, 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 the cherry on, on, on the cake. Um, we had the Moody's call last week, and we had the AAA credit rating reaffirmed. And I think I sent an email to all the board members, uh, the comment from the Moody's analyst, and it was, it was nice to hear, was that the only problem East Hampton has is that there's no such thing as a four four a rating so <laughs> that was that was pretty that, that you know hearing that after what we've been through for the last 10 years that was uh you know very gratifying and again like peter said march 15th is our last um principal and interest payment on the deficit bonds and at that point um at that point a lot of things end we don't get audited by the state every year. Our budget doesn't get audited, even though it's been a good thing. I can't complain. They've done a really good job. Uh, there are certain reporting requirements that we no longer have to uh, fulfill, uh, even though uh, it's been a good relationship with the controller. We, we send quarterly reports to the controller. We send a yearly report to the controller. They come in and audit our budget every year. So um, it's going to be you know, none of that's going to be required after March, but I think we're still going to be working closely with the control and to make sure going forward everything is everything is done the way it has been over the last 10 years. And well, as, as Len says, uh, financial oversight on the comptroller's part uh, will end with deficit finance fund uh, right. financing being completed, but uh, we, of course, will continue to strive for the best possible and most transparent reporting uh, and the highest standards of, of financial review. So, and Charlene and the staff have been great. And 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 uh, like I said, uh, Naraki will be here, you know, in the future. So uh, yeah, everything um, everything's looking good right now. And it's nice to have the reserves that we have. Uh, you know, they're there for a reason. And the last five months uh, have illustrated how important it is to have reserves and have some cushion and know that. You know, even with revenue shortfalls or downturns in revenue uh, and heightened expenses, we can get through it. And I think that's one of the things that impressed Moody last week when we had the call, that we were well positioned to handle this kind of an emergency. And I think that bode, bodes well for the future. Hopefully, we'll get through this. And, you know, it's almost like, wow, if we only had, if hurricanes were the only thing we had to worry about, right? <laughs> yeah. You know, and, and, I mean, this has been something totally different, but still in all, you know, it's, the, the, the reserves have really helped us, helped us get through this and uh, kept us sane. We have, you know, it gives you peace of mind to know that you have something to fall back on. So that's it. And, and I think that's one of the things I'm most proud of that the town's been able to uh, maintain and have this AAA bond rating reaffirmed in the midst of a international, you know, global pandemic. And, you know, many other municipalities are are in much worse shape and struggling and and whatnot. So I think um, you know every everyone involved should be quite proud. And let's keep let's keep this uh, winning streak going. Any other comments or questions? Dave, uh, Craig, thanks so much for joining us today. We appreciate all your hard work for us and 
course, Len and Charlene, our in-house staff as well. Yes, thank you very much, and we thank appreciate the, Thanks, uh, everyone. everything. Be well, Be everybody. Well. Stay safe. You too. Thank you. Thank you. You too. Thank you. Michael, do we have any uh, callers on the line? Yes, we do have one caller on the line. I will okay. unmute them right now and bring them into the meeting. Go to the caller. Hello, caller. You're live with the Town Board of East Hampton. Yes, hi. I just um, have a Do you concern. state your name, please, for the record? Uh, this is Loretta Steers. Loretta Steers? Hi, Loretta. How are you? Steers. Good. How are you today? Very well, thanks. Well, listen, my, my concern is, is uh, the lack of um, policing in Three Miles Harbor. So are you talking about uh, boaters' speed limit? It's a five-mile-hour no-wake zone inside the harbor except for the ski area? So are, is that your concern? People yeah, are maybe, that, maybe, that, maybe that's the key to addressing this, that it should be one or the other. Because people think that if they're going five and they're still creating a wake, it's fine. And then there are the perpetual speeders. So, so as I understand it, there's a five mile an hour speed limit, in which no vessel is supposed to exceed five miles an hour within the harbor, with the exception Correct. of the special water skiing area. And at Correct. any that's, speed, that's five miles an hour or less, you're not supposed to be creating the wake. So you could be going, you know, four miles an hour, but if you're creating a significant wake, you're still going too fast. It, it, the wake is that's in addition the to the speed limit. Right. That, that's the issue. Most people think because they're going five and creating a wake, it's still okay. You know, different holes create different wakes. You know, sailboats right. can go a lot faster and, and not create any, any wake at all. So anyway, yes. I'm, I'm having a really quality of life issue and here on my boat. Okay. And I'm not so alone. So, you know... Okay, so you'd, you'd like uh, more attention paid by Marine Patrol within Three Mile Harbor regarding wakes and speed limits? Yeah, I mean, uh, most of the people around here know that there's nobody here. They go out, you know, Sundays, all day, the traffic, and, and my boat, I have a video of my boat just, like, almost violently rocking. I've spoke to several people. They just seem to ignore me, so you know, I'm not okay. able to do anything about it. All right, we will forward your concerns to Marine Patrol and see that they pay a little more attention in that location until people start paying attention to the rules. I mean, it's it's a lot of time. It's in the in the late afternoons, you know, or even right before it gets dark, people are coming in and they're. You're either in a rush or they just don't realize what they're doing. I don't. I'm not sure. Okay. But that seems to be that seems to be the the major time is like late afternoon, early evening, especially weekends. Mm -hmm. Okay, we'll pass that on to the harbor master and the marine patrol. I thank you very much for your time. Thanks. Thanks so much for taking the time to let us know. Appreciate that. Okay. All righty. Bye, bye bye. Michael, do we have any other callers on the line? No, we do not have any more callers. Okay. In that case, let's move on to our next work session agenda item, which is parking restriction changes for the Amagans Municipal Parking Lot. Uh, and we have Councilman Lee's presenting. David, do you have a, a presentation you want to put up on the screen? I do. I'll screen share one. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Supervisor. I uh, just wanted to uh, get back to the board. As we all know, I appreciate uh, the board and the community support. The Amagansi Municipal Parking Lot fields are under construction and, and expansion. And one of the processes now that the board has to look at is about the time restrictions in that lot. Um, I want just to quickly go through a, just a brief couple of pictures that might help the discussion. I'm just going to screen share something here.
and I will start that. So again, Ambiganza Municipal Parking Lot, it's on the north side of the Central Business District here. This is actually, uh, as it looked, I think this is from 2018. Uh, it has the Amagansa Privy in the, in the back right, uh, the back corner here with the library entrance here. Um, we purchased uh, probably about five years ago, I believe, uh, another central business property here to the northeast corner, uh, which we went out to bond for, for additional parking spaces. Uh, currently, just if you haven't been there, I would like you to see uh, some of the parking construction that has been done. Uh, this is the, on the left is a picture with the, the, old, uh, the old field barn or the Baker Brothers barn. In the background, you'll see where there is now going to be the pedestrian uh, walkways to the right. They're putting down a sub base. As we uh, approved last week, we found a clay lens in there, uh, which we had to remove at an additional cost. And now they're backfilling that with, uh, uh, with material that's going to be very stable. Next set here is showing the ADA ramps again uh, to make sure that there is uh, ADA uh, access accessibility to the new parking area. We put, uh, there's new ramping in the design to make it safer for those individuals. Um, we talked about the Amagansett alleyway, which is in the Southwest corner a lot uh, in between the restaurant and the, nail, uh, the current restaurant and the nail salon. This is what it'll look like before. You could tell in the picture on the right, the white here is where there were trip hazards. Uh, the board also agreed that we remove the trees and we put down new concrete walkways. The lighting is there and it's a much more of a fresher look for everyone and a, and a safer look onto, onto Main Street. Now, one of the biggest problems in the alleyway is it didn't meet the ADA accessibility guidelines because the trees were planted in the center of the sidewalk. Right. There wasn't yeah. enough space to get around between there Correct. and there. Wow. And a lot of the business owners are very happy happy for that, and you, you can see it's being used well now. Um, the new design here, uh, this is the final design that we are moving forward with. It's got a uh, handicapped spaces. It's going to be 10. The spaces in the old field with the redesign, it's 131. The spaces in the newly, I'm sorry, did my screen freeze on everyone? Yeah, yeah the screen's a little slow. It's, we're still in the alley. Okay. <clears throat> I apologize. Okay, the handicapped spaces are 10. Uh, the old, uh, uh, the spaces in the old field with the redesigns 131. The spaces in the new, uh, uh, the newly built, I should say built parking field is 44. That's in the top right uh, for a total of 185 spaces that have turning radiuses for commercial uh, vehicles for de their deliveries and ha handicap accessibility uh, in all areas then too. Um, the current parking restrictions, which is part of uh, uh, the code of 24068, uh, are three. The Amagansa parking lot right now, uh, we added this two years ago. The, the green spaces are 30 minutes and all green line spaces. Those are primarily on the southern border uh, behind the wine store and behind the library. Uh, those have been very, very effective. I've, I've heard from many business owners and also the library director that they've been extremely effective for their users to quickly go in and out of the lots. Uh, or just to take care of their, their chores of the day, if you want to say. Uh, second of all, the white line spaces are two hours. That's about 50% of the spaces in the, that lot currently. Uh, and then the yellow spaces are 24 hours. And the caveat there is no, all except no parking on the first Monday of each month from 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. Uh, those are put in in 1992, as you can tell. I believe that was for either street cleaning of the parking lot, but it also allows for uh, a trigger effect for if there's any abandoned cars for their removal, which we have recently done as of last year. Some cars had to be removed out of there. They were abandoned. Mm -hmm. um, we've discussed this multiple times. Uh, at uh, We've done it at the town board level, but also uh, the Amagansa Citizens Advisory Committee gave some recommendations. Their recommendations right now, <clears throat> and I'll show them on the chart next, is for 30 minute parking for all spots in the southerly row, uh, excluding the handicapped spots. Two hour parking in the main lot from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. They say May 15th to September 15th, including the handicapped spots and including the EV, which is the electrical, electric vehicle charging spots also, which we have six in the, south, the northwest corner. And they're, they're well used now also, those spots. 
Um, 72 hour parking in a new lot, including a handicap with a resident sticker, uh, 24 hour parking, uh, the discussion of 24 hour placards for the apartments that are on the parking lot that don't have off street parking currently uh, and no commercial parking. What I did is I just marked up a document here for us to see how this would work here uh, based on some of their recommendations and we'll get into some talking points here. Uh, the bottom is the 30 minute parking uh, that is in the Southern, Southern Lee Row. Uh, you see that that's 11 parking spots that are currently there right now, eight on the Western side and the three on the Easter side, Easterly side of the entrance, which will be coming to the middle here. I'll move that forward one more. It just adds and then the whole area of the current lot, which will be redesigned and repaved. It's gonna be two hour parking. That's the recommendation. And the third one then would be 72 hour parking into the newly formed, uh, formally, newly formed lot, including the handicap, which is about 44 spots. Uh, before I go okay. any can further. I just, can I just ask a question before you move on? The, the two hours, is the entire main lot, except for the 30 minute along the Southern edge. So the back That's edge by the fields is also two hour. That is correct. In two hour at the charging stations as well, regardless that is of correct. whether or not you're charging a car. That is correct. Okay, thanks. Um, the the lot is uh, the lot is ready to be paved. Uh, it actually was uh, the contractor could have started paving as last week. Uh, the supervisor, myself, discussed this, and appropriately, the supervisor decided that we should um, delay this because we didn't want to put anything more into August, it, it, particularly this year in August. So. The paving project will be done in September, um, and the striping will come immediately after that. So we I would want to try to make some decisions with this, get to a public hearing, because it would be changing the code potentially uh, as soon as possible, so that the striping can reflect what the town board's potential decision uh, would be here. Um, I'm just gonna move one more forward here. For discussion is time restrictions. I would like to discuss uh, trailer and commercial parking, potential restrictions in, in that lot, uh, the placard parking, which was uh, uh, requested by uh, M against CAC, and then off-street directional signage, and I'll explain that in a little bit. Uh, off-street directional signage, um, I'm gonna, I'll show you some pictures in a little bit when we go back to FaceTime here. Uh, there, we have EV charging stations. We also have a, the comfort station in the back. The AVIS uh, uh, years ago put a very nice um, four by four post pointing back to the park in the privy. Uh, uh, the concerns are not the concerns. The desire is to put a potential um, arrow, uh, arrow with comfort station in the alleyway or in the front area. Very tastefully done. Just try to direct people to where the municipal parking, the comfort station, the EV charging stations are. I show you a couple of examples that we might be looking at. Um, and I'm gonna just stop that share right now and I can pull it back up uh, as we need. But um, overall, I know that parking lot very well. Uh, on any other season besides COVID right now, uh, it, it, the, the parking lot's just, it's full. So the, the 30 minute parking is the easiest one. Uh, it is, it's been a resounding success of using right now. Uh, it allows for enough of a turnover for the uh, for the quick exit of your car to get a coffee, to drop off a book, uh, to do a very quick commerce there. Uh, the parking lot does get used by a lot of people that are traveling into uh, if New York City's place places west, if you want to say, for a weekend for an overnight trip. So there uh, there is a there's a lot of usage that way also, and again. The parking lot gets used as any municipal parking lot would be for a lot of uh, a lot of individuals that uh, that work in the area then too. Um, one thing that I've noticed in uh, recent years, it's a little of course less this year, um, was a little bit more overnight parking, uh, commercial uh, taxi, or livery, Uber drivers. Um, they they stay there overnight after their after their shift. I do know there's sections in the code that discuss that in Montauk in the past. So as we look to reformulate what we want to do as far as parking restrictions here, 
we might want to look at other sections in the code that we can maybe pull in some options. Uh, I know when Sylvia and I discussed um, the ditch plain area parking lots, we, we didn't allow for any trailers to be parked in that area. Is that something that we want to uh, not allow in there? I, I would be personally in favor of that. Uh, do we not want to allow any, um, any uh, type of parking of, uh, of taxis or um, uh, do we want to make a taxi stand? That's just another discussion. Uh, but those are some of the recommendations. I want to get this to the board level for discussion. Uh, I know a lot of us use, use that lot and uh, I've heard from our constituents and that's the presentation. And then we can just go around, around the horn. Any uh, questions or comments from board members? So David, if you were an employee that was working at one of the stores, are you in the 72 hour lot? I think it really depends on what's, first of all, what's closer. Uh, people take the closest spot or what, what, what would affect you. Most people, uh, most people how it works right now, they would park in the yellow spots, the 24 hour spots, so they don't have to come back and move their cars. But there's a fine out, minute amount of those spots available. Uh, right. So you do see some people moving in and out. Uh, you do see individuals parking there and then getting picked up to go to a different location also. Uh, that's a small a small minority of the cars, but you, you also see that the municipal parking lot being used that way too. Um, but but yeah, I, I would think that the majority, if we did switch it to uh, to some of the recommended ways from ACAC and you know designated one lot all 30 or two hours and then the other lot 72 hours, that if I was an employee, I'd be looking for the spots in the 72 hour parking area so I didn't have to move my car. Is the placard uh, idea related to employees that work there? Is that what they're talking about? I've heard that you know, as an idea before. Sure, no, the placard idea is, uh, the, it, this. so this parking lot was bought in 1971 through a town board referendum. And it's a very interesting referendum if you start looking back at it. Some of our most uh, useful and beautiful locations of the town of East Hampton were on that referendum, Sammy's Beach, Ditch Plains, and I believe Gerard Drive also. Um, so the land was, the land was purchased uh, and the placard was at the discussion point upon uh, some of the property owners there that have apartments above their properties, but don't have any off street parking. Uh, meaning, uh, for, uh, I, I have it here. There's four of them. Um, four of them totaling eight, no, ten, ten, uh, uh, ten, sorry, excuse me, ten apartments that actually are in the central business corridor that directly attach to the municipal parking lot, but don't have any current off street parking right now. So there's four locations for 10, for 10 apartments. That was our, the account I have. Um, it would, to be able to give those individuals a little bit of, of relief to come in, uh, I, I would think potentially we'll talk with Carol about this to, to the town clerk, would, would they would show a long-term lease for that location, allow for one per unit, uh, and that they could park there, let's say for 24 hours. Uh, so, so David, are, are these pre-existing or were these developed these apartments developed as part of like the affordable housing uh, of business and did they pay um, fees in lieu of parking when they developed all, or do you know anything yeah. about that? They're all pre-existing uh, pre to, to, to that. Uh, the locations are uh, the pe above the pizzeria, okay. uh, above uh, the Soto Sopa restaurant, above the old um, post office, which is... Um, uh, Hampton Real Estate uh, and above the wine store. Those are locations that don't have off street parking uh, that are attached to the prop uh, parking lot. The history of that, what I've been told is that they all have their, they all have, I believe their septic system in, in, in the parking lot. Um, uh, and parking lot and part of the parking lot was owned by these property owners at one point and that there was a, a situation that led that the town was able to purchase back some of the property uh, or gift to the property for this, these development uh, to be able to continue to allow to have their septic system in the parking lot. Again, that's, okay, that's so that, ancient. So parking for the apartments is an issue that we'll have to consider and yep. how we would manage that. That's correct. Um, 
And, and, and where are these folks parking now, David? Are they in the 24 hour spots, the yellow line spots? Yeah, pri pri primarily, that's that's what I've noticed. I, I honestly, Sylvia, I only know one car. I can only recognize one car, but yes, that's what some of the landlords have said that they, they park in the, the 24 hour spots primarily. And is there any uh, parking on the street? Um, is parking it all two hour, one hour? Yeah, parking on the street is all, all, all two hour, and it's no, there's no overnight parking on the street also, and two. Okay. So it's all in the back parking lot. Um, I, as far as the 72 hour parking, uh, I, I know there was a recommendation for resident only aspect to it. I, I'm not necessarily leading towards the resident only aspect. aspect. Uh, it's municipal parking lot. There's um, some people might not have the resident permits. I'd, I'd be more open to allow anyone to park there, first come, first serve on there, and see how it's how it's used first that way. So the uh, biggest draw for the long-term parking there is the Jitney stop, which is not too far away. Is that is that why people are parking more than 24 hours at a time? Yes. Uh, I'm just gonna, I'm going to pull it back up one more time if you don't mind. I'm just yeah. yeah they 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 end up. Uh, parking there, going on to the Jitney, uh, or some people actually, the, the train is also, the train station we changed to 72 hours also. But yeah, you, that's what you see a lot. You see a lot of people uh, leaving their car there for the Jitney. Uh, you, you see a lot of cars actually left there for a lot longer time than that because the parking, the parking restrictions in the wintertime are nearly as enforced as strictly as they are during the summertime. Uh, so there's a lot of long-term parking demand for this parking lot because again one of the infrastructure increases that the town board did two years ago uh was developed a westbound bus stop uh and it's 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 a very quick little walk in a lighted area safely from the parking area to that bus stop and it's and it's well used actually it's probably one of the busier stops in east hampton so at this have. point your recommendation is to not restrict it to resident only and see how it goes that would be my opinion on there. Uh, we my could opinion, obviously I, revisit any of these uh, plans at a later point if they need to be adjusted. I I would agree with that right now. I think all plans we can we can adjust to see how the user groups are using them. Uh, but primarily, most all the recommendations that they that are that have been made, I I would I would support. I just think the resident only right now. I would like to allow everyone to use it, see how it works. Uh, if we need to restrict it more, we'll go from there. The only other one was about uh, the, the time frame. Uh, uh, one of the recommendations of the time frame was, I'm gonna, uh, sorry, it was for two hour park in the main lot from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m., uh, but also to be seasonal from May 15th to May, May 15th to September 15th. My only concern with that is that that then leaves nothing enforceable for the rest of the time meaning that anyone could park in that main parking lot for as long as they want uh, because there's no timing restrictions there. So I personally would think that a two hour parking uh, in, in that parking lot uh, would, would suffice year round. And that's currently how it is. Uh, again, as I said, enforcement of that two hour restriction after the main height of the season, after the TCAOs are not there, are, it's not nearly as enforced as strict as during the middle of the season. But again, if we remove that seasonally, that means there's yeah. no trigger there for to say that cars cannot just park there months on end. Yeah, I agree. I think if month. the problem develops, then you can deal with the problem. Yeah. Yeah, can I ask a question, uh, David? Did, the, did AMAC have a position on the resident only um, parking in the 72 hour area? Uh, well, ACAC, yes, ACAC, uh, they, they, they ACAC. like the oh, yeah, they, Sorry they, about they, that. No worries. <laughs> They like uh, resident-only parking in the 72 hours. Uh, okay. David, can I just ask you, because it would help me visualize. So right now, how many 30-minute parking spaces do we have? 10, I believe. And how many will we have if we do this whole southerly row? Are we picking more up or we're it's picking, we're picking one up? Pick one up. Okay. And do we know if there's... Um, ever a time where those are all full? I've, I've seen them all full. Yeah, I, I've seen them all full. But again, 
if, if you're, you don't see them there an hour later, what ends up happening is there, one of the major users that group users there is an ex exercise workout class facility, a uh, boot camp facility. Mm -hmm. And the reason why in the town code, the exercise studios have a very, uh, a lot, it's actually for every 50 square feet is one parking spot compared to every 180 square feet is one parking spot for retail. But in the town code, for, ever, for exercise studio, if you're within 500 feet of a, a municipal parking lot, it's back to 180, so it's the same as retail. But I believe the intent in the code when this was first designed in 85 is that it's because there's such a turnover there. So being exercise, on um, exercise classes, they turn over every hour, but people then go get coffee, they mill around, which is what you want. Um, but again, those classes have 30 or 40 people in it every hour. So these parking spots along there allow for others to quickly walk in, mm -hmm. do their commerce, if they're not there for an exercise class. That's that's how the parking lot's been used in the last couple of years. It's just for and, people to quickly pull in and grab something and go. Yes. And and with the, with the new now adding an additional thirty minute parking spot, we are not making the handicap spots along that southerly row thirty minutes. Those are still going to be two hours, correct? That's correct, and and there is uh, more of handicap spots there than is uh, regulated by the ADA. Uh, I and I, uh, ACAC also wanted to try to get a reduction. We, there was a reduction of one. Uh, I'm very comfortable with the amount of spots, handicap spots in that location. Uh, one of the reasons why in the southern area is that there's less spots is because of the turning radiuses that were have to be had to be designed for some of the delivery trucks. So we lost a spot on a couple of the edges there um, to make sure that those those trucks, you know, our 18 wheeler trucks can be able to turn around without uh, damaging any other cars parked or also being having to wait for people to move. Okay, then I have a question. So now turning to the, the 24, I'm sorry, the two hour parking, you had said earlier that right now about 50% of the lot is, is two hours. So before the redesign, how how many two-hour spots were there? Do you know? Yes, Kathy, I should have this for you. So good. Okay, one moment. I'm sorry. I, I'm such a visual learner. Nope, I got you. So, so if you're looking at on the screen right here, yep. all these bottom rows right here where, where I'm at, th this is all two-hour parking in here. Okay. And a couple on the peripheral edges of these areas here. Everything in the back row and along here are the 24 hour parking. Okay. And then this is the EV charging stations over here. I thought is they were okay? in the that, back by the restroom. The restroom the here. Station. EV charging stations, handicap. These are currently 24 hours. Yep. This row, these two rows here, this pod here is 24 hours. And then this pod, this pod is two hours. And then a couple on the cursory over here in the corner and over here are also two hours. So how many two hour spots are we picking up with the redesign? I have, let me get that number, Kathy, for you. One second. around 54 there for two hour, I think. Uh, 59, about 40. Kathy, about 40. We're getting 40 more two hour spots. If, if we go with the whole parking lot, two hour parking besides the, um, uh, the 10. Sorry. Okay. And then 30, 30, 30. It would be okay. of the 10 uh, handicap spots. Okay. Not handicap spots, the 10 uh, 30 minute spots. Okay. And then as far as the, um, right now we've got 24 hour spots. That's correct. And 40, 44 of those. So we've got, and then you're not, um, 
Let me go back to ACAC. What is what is ACAC saying for 24 hour what they want? For 20, That's, so, so they want 20. So right now we're going to convert the the 24 hour spots to 72 hour spots. That's correct. Okay. So you see no, how that there's a there uh, for you know to see how it goes right now. There's uh, we've heard from residents that there's a good use of the parking fields for longer term parking if someone needed to travel to a medical appointment up island, maybe Montauk, wherever it might be. Uh, for, uh, and that would be a duration that would cover that time frame. David, is, is there a time of day associated with the two hour parking, like from eight to six, two hour parking in the lot or? Currently right now, no, there is not. It's all, it's all day. Um, so it could be all night too. Like if, if you were to park there at seven o'clock, you'd have to leave your car by nine. Yes. Yeah. Currently right now there it, it's two, two hour parking. Is there any consideration for, um, you know, taking the two hour parking after a certain point in the evening and just lifting it between the hours of, you know, I don't know what it would be, 8, 8 and 6 a.m., 8 p.m. to 6 a.m., something yes. like that? Yes. Yeah, that's one of the recommendations is to do a uh, two hour parking in the main lot from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Okay, uh, that's what I was getting at. Okay. Yeah. Those are mostly, I think that would be appropriate to have some set hours where the two hours mandated and then beyond those hours you become relaxed. Yeah, and the discussion on that was with some business owners and uh, members of the public is that uh, a lot of people like go to go out and have dinner or they're or they're restaurant workers that um, uh, that park there, let's say at four o'clock, go in, a sous chef will go in, prepare meals, rest of people go there. They don't want to be rushed out an hour and a half into their meal to, to move a spot and it just doesn't affect affects commerce negatively my only have, concern sorry you also have like the stephen talk house is there and you know that's more after regular business hours but they might have people who use that lot for more than two hours that's exactly that's exactly correct peter yeah and um, then david so how many so right now the 24 hour spots are being converted to 72 hour spots theoretically and we're we're getting 44 72 hour spots what is that an increase of or did we lose spots compared to 24 hour spots it's a, it's a decrease in total spots yeah. from Isn't from that a pro to me that's you know if so i, I work at a restaurant along there and I have to go into work. The only place I can park is in the 72 hour lot. So I'm, so the folks, do we have a, like a count of, you know, during the season and how many employees, um, but that, those but businesses generate? No, not offhand. I, I think we're, we're, we're too low on. Um, so maybe we want to consider taking that row along the farm field and the west, east side of the entrance to the farm field. The, the, the only corner, corner, corner there's another one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. It's 11 spots. 11 spots and maybe adding those to the 72 hours. Well, what were you going to say, David? <clears throat> the only counter to that is that if, if we, if the, time parking restriction at two hours is only between 9 a.m. and 5 p.m. If you're working in a restaurant at night, that, that might be able to cover your shift if you come in at four. No, yeah, no, but restaurant kitchens start, you know, in the morning. You know, you go past any restaurant, you know, their, their crews, you know, they're, they're prepping all day long. So I yeah. think maybe we should consider having, uh, adding those 11 spaces, not having those two hour, but to add those to longer term. Okay. Yeah. Something to consider. Okay. I'm sorry. Which spaces are you talking about? I'm, I'm right up here, Jeff. The you northeast see corner of the existing oh, lot. Okay. There's, there's okay. 11 spaces there. And, okay. if, if we... and they're immediately adjacent to the new lot. So they're kind of set aside. And, and I think maybe they should be designated for a longer period of time. Uh -huh. yeah, I, I would want to consider a third. Um, the, those would be 24 hours, and then 72 hours would be the new parking lot, and then the rest of the old parking lot, two hours, or is that just too many shifts? No, it's, it's primarily it's just how we write in the code, and I think the best way that, that could be, well, we should be successful would be not to 
try to tell exactly what spots they are, but just do it by colors of lines. So we can write what we want in the code in by colors of lines successfully. So if that's a layer you want to add into it, it, it works also. I, so, I, I think I would add those spaces to either 72 or make them 24 hour. And if you make them 24, then you got another co color scheme you're adding. I'm not sure you want to. So you would, I just, one of the things, you know, 72 hour parking is where people do go out of town or go to into the city to, as uh, David said, you know, I know friends that go to their doctors or specialty doctors and they park, you know, um, there for, to take the jitney. So, you know, other, I'm trying Maybe to think, what, that's what my number. first question. Well, my, no, my first question was where are the employees going to park? Yeah. Um, yeah. So maybe we should reduce the number of 72 hour spaces and put those at the fur at the farthest end, the north section of the new lot, maybe just that row of 10 or 12 there and make everything else 24 hour or maybe the outside rows of that lot 24, uh, 72 hour, make the rest 24, including that northeast corner. Would that be enough spaces we think to uh, address that concern? Yeah, I mean, well, it's I hard to know without knowing how many, if we could find out from business owners how many employees they have, just as a general number, because. Um, and, and we're dealing with, with, you know, the north side of Main Street, the south side of Main Street is really parking, should be taken care of by the parking lot that was developed for. Right, right. Yeah, no, I'm not suggesting we ask, you know, Mandala, you know, how many people they have. I'm suggesting we ask the rest, the folks that are on the north side of 27. So the, what's yeah. the total number of spaces, David? Was it 140? One, uh, 180, 180. Uh, 185 and 10 handicapped spots. So 175 that are not handicapped. 175? Non-handicapped. That's the number of two-hour spots. That's a that's a total number of spots. All right. So that would be if you if you gave those thirty-two spaces twenty-four hours. That's you know that's like um, eighteen percent of parking given up just to employees. And so I think the that's far side, the far side, Peter. If we go the north side. And the western easterly side is 23 spots here on the outside ring of the new lot. Here. Yeah, maybe make those the 72 hour. I mean, you know, that's that's a pretty big commitment of spaces. That's a lot. Hour. And, uh, you know, that would give you something like 32 with the northeast corner of the existing lot and the center aisles of uh, the new lot. That's 32 spaces. I, th I think you got to move more in that direction with a 24 hour. Okay. Given the concerns about employee parking. Mm -hmm. um, Does that seem reasonable to everyone? I also just want to point out, I know that we're in a different time frame and the free ride isn't here this summer, but you know, what, what a concern was um, by ACAC and others, I don't know if it's been brought up, David, um, when I was the liaison was that they didn't want that parking lot to become beach parking and have the free ride pick everybody up because there is stop um, there for free ride or there has been in the past. So, um, you know, I think we have to just plug that into to our thought process. I, I completely agree with you on that. Um, I, free ride hasn't gone in there in the last couple of years. I don't know if it's in their business model, but uh, I, I, it has to be monitored. I'm fortunate enough to be back there a lot uh, to sort of see how it, how it's worked over the last two decades. Uh, it's just it's just really tough to tell who who's in there for what what yeah. reasons all the time. But uh, I think a, a, an equitable way is designing it the way we just discussed with 32 hour, 24 hour, 72 hour parking. I think that's one of the most equitable ways any parking lot in the town of East Athens has to what the use. You, what the needs of the user groups or the residents would be. Someone watching the discussion uh, online has just texted me and suggested that the Amagansett Square employees are encouraged to park uh, in the north lot here. So, wow. um, 
Well, I think if you're having employees, you're supposed to be looking and looking for your site plans also. Right. Site plan. but, so, um, so when so when the square was developed, that certainly was you know taken into consideration. Well, we know that parking all over is is really you know maxed out uh, regardless of who's parking where. But I think you know you have to have a certain amount of parking uh considered for employees but uh it's just trying to find we're not we're not going to so solve everybody's parking problem with this plan because there's still not going to be enough parking for everybody who wants to park but i think trying to apportion it in you know percentages that make the most sense is really what we need to come down on yeah so do you mind if i roll through this just with the board and if we can get some consensus maybe to uh then get some uh, some language drafted up for a potential public hearing, uh, and I, I will circulate that with Jameson, who ends up being my parking guru a little bit here. Yeah, uh, I, I think uh, again, I think is there consensus on uh, the seventy-two hour being reduced and the twenty-four hour being increased in terms of number of spaces? Yes, I, I support that. I think, but I, I would like to see what the percentage was. Well, you know now and what the proposed percentage is you know so, so kathy you want to try and hold to the same percentages well i i, I want to just, just I, I, I think we need to see that you okay. know, I, I know it would be helpful to me yeah I, i'd right. like to see so, it too so, so uh why don't we work on pulling that together we'll get the breakdown in the parking hours in the existing lot as they stand now and uh we'll reconvene on that so david if you could s circulate that to the board members and then we can uh, follow up well i i could i could break it out real quickly right now so in, in the two-hour parking lot right now and two-hour parking the main parking stall is right here we're looking at 103 103 spaces in the middle right now we add in the six up here so we'll be uh, for uh, for the um the ev charging stations will be at 109. If we were looking here then for the 24 hour parking total for these three sections, which see the numbers, it's say 11, 11 10, 10. and 11, we're gonna be at 30, 32. For these two sections over here, it'd be 13, I think that's a 10. Yes, yeah, so that'd be 20, 23. We're now at 11 then for the 30 minute parking. If we go back to the original uh, diet, diagram here it's, it's almost a 50 50 split right now we have 10 for 10 for 30 minute parkings on the bottom um i thought i just get a quick count of this here i'll just quickly count them out is three four five six seven eight nine ten eleven two top is 22 we got three four five six seven eight nine ten eleven thirty so you have 52 24 hour part uh, 52 two hour parkings right now uh 50. and 66 because that's 10 66 24 hour parking so you're looking at 100 and so it's 52 two hour and 66 24 hour so 60 40 ish Yeah, so the, the new plan is really skewing to two hour. It's definitely going more towards two hour. Yeah, and that- And is that-, that it's, it's not, a plan, it's just a recommendation that came back back. Again, mm -hmm. we're, we're here as a board, board decision, um, but this is just how the layout is. I'm, I'm just presenting the layout, the recommendations, and listening to everything. Uh, yeah. I, I completely understand where you're coming from on that, Kathy. So I think part of why it's skewing towards the two hour is because of the recommendations of the business community. Um, they want to see that turnover. They don't want to see those spaces taken up, um, you know, for 24 hours or even, you know, or 72 hours. They want to see people using that for commerce, not using it for other activities. So 
Um, I kind of understand if that's the direction. As I said, I haven't been to an ACAC meeting um, since David actually took over. Is that where they're going with this, David? Yeah, it's, that's definitely one of the discussion points, but still to have have a factor in of long-term parking for the necessity of traveling potentially west for whatever yeah, reason I, it might be. Yeah, yeah I, 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 I would be in favor of increasing the number of 24 hour spaces within the new lot and maybe i mean i don't know what the the total need is for the 72 but i think that would be the the, the one that i would be most comfortable reducing yeah because right now you had 60 if i'm doing this correctly you had 66 24 hour parking spots right now and you're going to 44 72 hour spots. So you're losing 22 spots. Of that and, time. Yeah. And yeah. Um, I, I, well, I think it's, you know. And you're encouraging, you're gonna encourage. So, I, you know, I live in Springs and I need to go into the city for a couple of days. And, you know, I can park in Amagansett as opposed for free, as opposed to parking in the village in long term and I have a much shorter walk to the Jitney from Amagansett. So you're gonna encourage people, I think, to want to use the long term parking at Amagansett as opposed to using it in the village. Because now you don't have to walk through yeah. the park to get right. to your parking spot. Well I, would, I will uh, say that I, I David correct me if I'm wrong, but it said twenty four hour parking, but I think people used it to be away for a weekend. They didn't use it and come back within 24 hours. They used that parking lot and, you know, for a, going into the city on a, you know, Wednesday and coming back on a Friday. The enforcement becomes much more decreased after September 15th of the time regulations and yeah. in, that, in the municipal. Yeah, I, I think we should really focus on more of the 24 hour out of that new lot and much less than 72 hour. And then once we get it, in the off season and there aren't any real constraints and issues with the lot being full all the time, you know, the, the enforcement's just not going to be uh, a problem. So, so if we look at the tip, if you can see my controller here, mm -hmm. uh, these sections here are five and five, that's 10, 15, 15, and this is 21 and then 22. Uh, that 22, if we add that those to, the 32 uh, would bring us back up to, well, it was 54, sort of actually just over where we were. Well, what, what do we think is a reasonable number out of the total to, to vote to 24 hour? I mean, maybe they just take take that approach. You, you, I mean, you, have 100, you said you had 181, a number of those are handicapped. 185, so 185 and uh, you have, what, 11 handicapped? 10 handicapped. So take take those off. And then, you know, I, I would think like 10 or 15 would be the max that you'd want to devote to 72 hours. I think Kathy's point about you're basically inviting people to come and park their car there long term, um, you know, as opposed to being dropped off at the Jitney or something, you know, by someone else or taking a cab or an Uber or something. You know, that's, that's a long time to get free parking. You also have 72 hour parking at the train station now too. We did that too. Yeah. So That's maybe more of a, yeah. So maybe we really don't need to devote more than about 10 spaces there for now. Mm -hmm. And the rest can be 24 in that so lot. In, in, in that discussion, let's say it was the 10 spaces here, that would then give us 32 and 13, uh, 45. Yeah, 45 plus the whatever this is over here. Was that 11, 10 or 11? No, that's just, that's with them. So it'll be oh, okay. uh, 11, uh, 11, 10, 11, and 13. I think 45. that's a much better number. I think that makes more sense, more balanced to uh, the actual need and, you know, use every day in that area in season. I think we should get a follow-up in writing. So, so let's, yeah. let's uh, 
Yeah, it's a little hard to follow. I agree, Jeff. Yeah. So I think I think we understand sort of the basic idea here is that we want to increase the 24, reduce the 72. Let's let's reconvene. Let's give it some more thought. Try to get a little more input um, on that. Can I just? That's that's no problem. That's easy to do. The the two points I just want to go in also, which I think are pretty easy yeses. Commercial trailer parking. I I'm I'm against it in here. Um, you mean uh, just you mean just the trailer, or do you mean like a a truck that comes in, say a landscaping truck comes in pulling a trailer, so that they can pick up lunch? No. Oh, no, well, yeah, parking of a trailer. We actually, we did that in, um, I, I believe it was the, the Ditch Plains lots. It actually, it's section 240.27.7. No, no person should park a trailer at Ditch Plains Beach parking area east this, um, unless otherwise permitted pursuant to a mobile food concession contract trailer. Okay, so, so when you say trail, I'm just trying to understand what you mean. Do you mean... The landscaping truck that's pulling a, a small trailer behind him parks in two spaces, or do you yes. mean uh, just okay. adjust the trailer? Somebody unhitches their trailer there in the seventy-two hour space. Or, you know, we've seen that. Yes. Yeah. I, I know. I'm just trying to get at you. Want to just prohibit all trailers from parking in the lot? Uh, it, the, code, the section of the code we have says such trailers are normally connected to a cab or motorized unit for traveling or hauling. And then uh, a trailer shall be defined as any structure designed for mounting upon wheels and incapable of moving or traveling upon uh, under its own power. Okay, so you want to prohibit all trailer parking in, the, in all both lots? Is that is that what you're you're asking us to consider? Yes. Okay. Board members have a feeling. Any feelings about that or questions, concerns? Yeah, I, I think it's, yeah, I would not, I think I'm, I agree with no trailers, no, no commercial parking. Yeah, I, I'm going to agree. Well, that's a different thing, Sylvia. Yeah. Well, Com you, no commercial parking versus no parking in trailers. Those are two different things. Okay, so, but if it's a landscaper, he's, he's commercial. So um, but, if it's a. the plumber's commercial too, and he might just have a van. So I think. If we're talking about trailers, let, let's let's keep commercial out of it and just leave it as trailers, whether they're commercial or not. So I frankly, I mean, whether if you're towing your camper trailer and you you know you want to pull in there, versus you're towing your landscaping trailer, what's the difference? Or, or what if you're a musical act and you have a trailer and you're performing at the talk house? Talk house. What about I know that they typically. Park on Usually the they park the bus out front right. or whatever, right. and, the, yeah. and I think uh, they also have their own little small lot area. But how about we say no overnight trailer parking? We can we can pull that specifically out, and make it overnight trailer parking. I'm just trying to narrow the focus on: do we just want to ban all trailers from the lot? I w I would. I think I you would. can make a justification for it. I mean, I. You know, it's kind of a tight lot. Um, it's it's pretty difficult to park a vehicle with a trailer in a in a lot like that. If you think about it, how are you going to do that? Unless you just happen to pull in and there's two spaces and you can right. pull right in and through. Right. Otherwise, they're going to be parking in the, you know, places where they're not allowed to park, right. hopping out real quick to get something. So, uh, you know, and we certainly don't want to see people just like ditching their trailer in the 72 hour lot no. uh, while they have it for sale or something. I don't, I don't know. It just seems like it should be really uh, focused on providing parking for those who are using that lot with a single vehicle. Okay, so are you suggesting then no overnight commercial trailer parking, that's it? I don't, I, don't think, I don't think we should have trailers in the lot. That's not why we're building the lot. We're, you know, we're trying to have employee parking. We're trying to have people that are visiting the shops and running errands and stuff. I don't see how trailers fit into this framework. 
Okay. I don't have a problem. You, you're pulling in to use the restroom. You know what I mean? You, you. I don't have a problem with them using the, the if they're parking legally in there. If they can find two spots. Parking, something we have to. Regulate. I think it's overnight that the, that's an issue. What do I want I a, a delivery? I'm just now thinking. You want to get a delivery service person that's delivering something that sometimes it takes an hour to deliver. You know, enough enough uh, food food provisions to the pizzeria or such. Well, isn't that take, don't they, Isn't there like loading unloading zones though for that? There's no defined loading on loading zones. They usually zones. park behind the cars. Just yeah. They per park perpendicular to the southerly facing lot. There, there is a section in the code for loading or loading zones, but there's no de definition to. You know, there's a definition to what it is, but there's nothing in that code uh, that section that tells uh, how what at what location it is. So I I, okay. I personally think. Pretty much say no. Why don't we? Uh, why don't we all consider that issue and the apportionment of the twenty-four hour, seventy-two, and two-hour, and uh, then reconvene on the issue. Okay. And then the last, the only sounds other like one is the need, Sounds like people need to sort of think about it a little bit longer, and and uh, we can trade some information back and forth. I'm fine on that. So I'll set this up in email and I'll email it out to everyone. Uh, as as we are plan just looking at the timing of this, as we are planning to potentially pave in after Labor Day, September, it'd be nice to see if we can get this notice for a public hearing potentially for that first uh, first meeting in September. Um, yes. So that well, I so, think, so I you think have to have legislation at the next work session, right? Because of the way it falls. To... Yeah, I think so. I think we need to yeah. know uh, next Tuesday that's doable. Uh, what we're doing in terms of the apportionment and whatnot, so we can what? move forward. Well, you know, obviously it's going to affect the color of the striping in the various areas and signage that'll be necessary. Uh, yeah. That the one side and the other side is obviously you have to get it codified to be enforceable. So. Yeah, it only only really doesn't affect much, too much there, Kathy, because we would continue in the code with the green. We continue the code with the white for the two hour. We continue with the code with the yellow for 24 hour. It'd be pretty much adding in uh, a 72 hour parking. And then we would just have to designate what those locations are. So gotcha. we'd be adding gotcha. one section and then the trailer to the code. Right. Okay. And you wouldn't have to do it all at once either, by the way. I don't think it's so pressing between 24 hour and 72 if you wanted to just make it all 24 hour and then later come back and dedicate a 72 hour portion. I just want to say a word if I can uh, about the alleyway. Um, you know, I'm glad to see that it's handicap accessible, but it's, it's a little uh, stripped down looking and not very uh, uh, enticing or inviting. And I'd really like to see some effort put into green it up a little bit. I mean, even if it's just planters, I know the village has done a great job with planters, but something to make that that alleyway look a little bit more. Uh, I, I agree rural. that after the, you know, with the newly paved sidewalk, uh, it's pretty stark looking. I did notice in one of the photographs that there, there are some planters that have been installed. Uh, it wasn't in every photograph, but, uh, you know, there is certainly an opportunity to beautify that. And maybe some yeah. of the yeah. I'd like to make a real effort to make it. I mean, uh, yeah, that's yeah. A A B I S perhaps would want to take that up and, and work on. Yeah, I've that. spoken to one of the property owners, and A B I S is uh, uh, interested in putting the planters and uh, in the pat uh, planters and also some um, seats out there. Uh, there is one property owner that just non responded to. Um, to the idea of putting a, a, a mural up that was part of the ABIS, but that's that's part of it, Jeff. I agree with you on that. Okay. So that'll be an ongoing effort to try and beautify that alleyway. It certainly functions uh, now, and it's I think it's really important that we've improved it to meet the ADA requirements. Certainly, you know, it wasn't really passable before. Uh, so, work in progress. Thank you. Yeah, I think it looked a little scary almost to walk back there um, that using that alleyway. Now it looks a little 
sterile. So we kind of went from from one side of the of it to yeah. the other. So I, I, the other, yeah. I think in time with ABIS and the local businesses, um, you know, those owners want it to be beautiful too. So I, I think we'll get there. It's just going to take probably another season to figure out exactly how to do it without planting trees or bushes that are undermine any of the. We should have an alleyway design contest. <laughs> we could do that too. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I, I think we'll get there, but I agree with the assessment that it looks a little, you know, yeah. yeah. Barren and the other direction. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay, so we'll reconvene on those numbers and try to get the public hearing schedule for pending legislation to uh, codify those hours of parking in the lot. David, I want to thank you for all your work on this. It's uh, no problem. I know it's been a lot to put together and you've been uh, working really hard to make sure that these lots get built and reconfigured. So appreciate that. You know, I, just, I just want to say, you know, it seems like a simple task to add on a several, you know, uh, parking spaces, 40 parking spaces, re, you know, resurface it and, and put in new lines. That seems, you know, like an easy task nothing like this is an easy task and i really have to commend david for sticking with it and for going back and forth with ACAC act too to make sure that that their voices are heard and this is a municipal parking lot for everybody in east hampton but um you know it, it's it's nice to to see that the back and forth um and for all of us to to chime in and and david you you make it easy when you give us presentations like this that we can you know <laughs> see it well, it's my, my pleasure. I think the difference about this parking lot, you hit the nail on the head, Sylvia. It gets used by a lot of people in different hamlets. Springs comes to park here or going to New York. Uh, yep. We have one of the most beautiful vistas there on the farm field. So there's a feeling about this parking lot. You, you have to design it and get it correct. And this is just what transparency in government is. You know, we're, yep. we're, we're working our way through this right now appropriately, listening to everyone. So better to get it correct than wrong. And this yeah, this you. is a big project, even though you know it might seem like forty spaces, but yeah, you know, know. it's been a long from from acquisition to engineering, uh, design, construction, and you know now we're talking about the final stages. Um, so thank you for shepherding this along. Day. How and how long did it take to get a comfort station there? <laughs> I think it was seventeen. It was seventeen years. So you know, maybe you making this. <laughs> at least, at least that. Right. So, yeah. Yeah. It, it, yeah. My pleasure. I'll get the information to the board at ASAP. All right. Thanks, David. Yep. Okay. Thanks very much. So, uh, while we're on the subject of uh, traffic and signage and whatnot, um, we had uh, several requests for the installation of a stop sign at the intersection of Ferryman and a middle highway and if i can just share my screen here <clears throat> so this is the intersection in question and if we pull out a ways you can kind of get your bearings a little bit better this is three mile harbor road here on the right side of the screen running north south and uh, <clears throat> berryman uh, has become something of a cut through like many of our residential streets in order to avoid avoid uh, congested intersections, which you find as you get closer to North Main Street uh, and Three Mile. Um, so this is a three-way intersection. It's a T intersection and there's no stop sign at Berryman. And while there is a, a road that continues on that does service uh, Gabriel's Path and a number of other residences have access off of Middle Highway, goes quite a, quite a ways um, there's no stop sign on Middle Highway, and uh, people come down Berryman and just, and while I was there taking some photographs, a uh, car just comes by and, you know, kind of flies around the corner. Uh, fortunately, no one was coming the other way, but it's been of concern. Uh, this is another photograph from the ground, and you can see Middle Highway continues on, and Berryman uh, is in that direction. So, um, this is the approach and you can see the signage you know right angle turn 10 mile an hour um, 
but uh, again, I think where we have T intersections and right angles like that, there, there should be a stop sign at one of those uh, locations. And it seemed like the Berryman on the north side of the road was the most likely candidate since middle highway continues straight. So a single stop paved? sign. Is it paved the whole way, middle highway? Middle highway is not paved the whole way. <clears throat> okay, so that's why and, people. But there, but again, you can see the number of people take access. You have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, uh, seven houses here. There's many more along here that could go Springy Banks or Middle Highway. So they, <clears throat> depending on where they ultimately want to go, they take Middle Highway. And although it's still a dirt, a dirt road. Uh, still has some somewhat significant traffic on it. Yeah. So there have been some near misses there. <clears throat> and um, again, I think any any time you have three-way intersection or more, there should be some signage uh, for one, at least one of those directions in, the, in a three-way uh, intersection. What about uh, putting one on Middle Highway as well? It's, there's I'm sorry, Jeff, uh, we couldn't get your audio. Can you say that again? I'm sorry. Uh, I, I was saying, well, uh, you know, there's a lot of traffic that goes up Middle Highway at, at pretty good speed. And I'm just wondering if a second one stopping traffic before they make the right turn would have be helpful as well. So generally, um, you know, the, we, Stop signs on straight roads are, are not something that's been supported in the past. Um, if you're talking about traffic calming measures, you know, that's that's not something stop signs have been used for, uh, for the most part. Uh, and again, you know, here's the three-way intersection. I think, you know, let's focus on on that question first. Yeah, I think that's a good idea. I mean, yeah, I see what you're saying because you're hitting a T intersection and there probably right. should be a stop sign. Right. It's true yeah. that as you hit that, your right hand view is a, it's it's a dirt road, so it's you know not less likely to be you know people speeding on it. But I uh, you know it's a, still a three way intersection, and I think that that would help. Um, and at some point, think, I'm sorry, go ahead. As I say, I do think middle high. I've driven middle highway a lot, and. People go fast on Middle Highway. They really, you know, because it's it's a straight shot for a long way. So you wind up, you know, speeding up, despite the fact that it's heavily residential. Uh, right. So I, then, with, with that, Jeff, if, if that stop sign would be, it would, I would recommend it down by uh, Bowersman Road in this area. So the area down just north of the, uh, the sand mine there. That's the best intersection because right over that, then it starts going up and down the hills a little bit. It gets a little bit Way. more lively. But um, I remember Middle Highway was unpaved up until 15, 15 years ago, maybe maybe 20 years ago. And, and now Berryman becomes a very much a cut through to through Mount Harbor, Berryman, all the way over towards Northwest. Um, right. I know they are. Yeah. Yeah, they go up to old old orchard. Correct. Yeah. yeah. Right. Or you can get through on Great Bar, depending on where you're at again yeah, that way. So it, 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 they're going two ways. They're going two different directions. Yeah, yeah, it is it is. I mean, at some point the rest of Middle Highway may become paved as well, but I, I just think um, again that's uh, that seems like a stop sign waiting to happen before an accident, hopefully. Okay, so where would you put the stop sign? On Berryman or? Yes, yeah, so on Berryman on the north corner okay. here. I, so. I think that's a natural place to put it. So that that's fine with me. Any other board yeah, comments? No, I'm, I'm good there. with that. Okay, so we'll, we'll uh, put together a resolution to schedule a public hearing then to add a stop sign there. Hey, um, Peter, I'd love to bring up something I've been getting emails about, which is um, on Akabonic and Collins, that the that stop sign is now backing people up um, onto, on Akabonic as they're headed south. 
And then I also had several emails about speeding on Akabonic now that the train trestle um, has been raised. So I, I, I just want well, to bring it up. Those not... seem to be contradictory of one another because, and I do think there, there used to be a lot of speeding coming south on Akabonic. Um, part of what's happening right now, and this hasn't really been the best uh, season really to understand the change of dynamics. With the trestles being raised, it's meant that some larger vehicles can travel on the road. <clears throat> but this intersection, when they were doing the work, uh, a stop sign was placed here. Yep. And uh, as you well know, and the town board decided to codify that and give it a right. period of time to better understand what the effects would be and whether or not we would stay with that. It was broadly supported at the time, and you know, with the um, with the ongoing work on Springs Fireplace Road, a lot of traffic has been diverted. People have chosen alternate ways to travel because of the delays on Springs Fireplace with the construction. So I think we're seeing um, extra traffic on Akabana due to that diversion. And I don't I don't live in Springs, but I, you know, maybe Kathy or David could could verify that. Uh, anecdotally, that's what I've seen. <clears throat> but, you know, this has always been a really difficult area, Collins Avenue to Cedar Street, North Main Street, and Akabonic, because there's so much traffic that can just there. It's a focal point of major, every major roadway coming out of Springs, basically, all funnels in there. <clears throat> you can see, you know, Three Mile Harbor and Springs Fireplace come together here. Akabana comes together here, and it, this is like the pinch point. And Cedar Street, which is a major thoroughfare yep. as well. So it, it's always been a problematic area in terms of just traffic congestion. But it seems to me that this is functioning better now than when Akabana uh, was just full speed ahead going southbound. Um, if anything, it's kind of calm things down. If you were so much traffic trying to make the left on Collins go through uh, and cars flying through that intersection was problematic. Uh, it slowed things down, but I'm not sure at this point whether that's a bad thing. I, I drive that way every day, um, coming and going. And honestly, the number of afternoons that I've seen a problem uh, it's decreased. Seems like the traffic actually has decreased there the last several times I've been through. Okay. Uh, and I, I mean, I don't, maybe it's worse earlier in the day. I mean, I, some, sometimes I don't get through that intersection until 6.30 or quarter or seven after leaving work. Uh, but the last couple of days, you know, I've gotten away by 5.15 or so. And one day, uh, right after we got an email from someone saying it was ridiculously busy, uh, I drove up and drove through, and there was no other cars in the intersection. So, okay. Yeah. Uh, it, you know, it varies. I I think it's a little early to make a a, a really um, conclusive um, determination about it because I I do think traffic is affected by Springs Fireplace. I think we should keep monitoring it. Uh, there were four cars backed up coming southbound on Akabonic the other day when I went through, but I've also seen it where it was backed up, you know, 15 cars. Yeah, so, yeah, so that's what the neighbors are talking about. It. I, I've not experienced that where, you know, where uh, they backed up, you know, with an extensive number of cars like 15. That's what the neighbors are talking about. And, uh, you know, I have a feeling that what we're seeing is just the difference between off season and on season. Because off season, it seemed nice and you know rational, but uh, apparently there's a good deal of confusion uh, from people coming up on Akabonic as to what they do and whether they should stop. There's been some talk. Uh, I, I, I was in touch with uh, Steve Lynch actually this morning on this, and he said there was some talk with the village of making it a three-way stop. Mm -hmm. um, but that 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 and that would um, rationalize it better because people would know coming up on Akabonic that they had to you know that they had to stop just like the stop sign on the left and the stop sign coming down on Akabonic, which I yeah, think the, 
end the confusion, but you know, I don't know what impact it would have on uh, backing cars up. But I don't think we saw that in the off season. Yeah, I agree. And again, I think a lot of the extra traffic was the diversion because of the construction on Springs Fireplace. So, you know, that the amount of traffic on Aquabonic may go down once that construction delay goes away. The other thing, the village just added a turning lane here. They added a turning Going lane. Northbound on Aquabonic, there's a left turn lane at Collins, which which helps keep, you know, the traffic uh, that would maybe cause gridlock uh, from where the light is at Pantago. There's light here. Um, again, most of the traffic going north is actually wanting to go to Collins and spread out from there to Cedar or up uh, Three Mile. Right. So. So if I well, could just answer a couple questions here. So first of all, we did have a um, that stop sign was put in by the MTA. We did have a public hearing. The public hearing hasn't been actually closed because of uh, uh, COVID-related uh, issues with transcripts. Um, I travel that way frequently daily, multi three, three, maybe three, four times a day. The level of diversion coming out of Springs where there's 18,000 trips a day coming down Springs Fireplace Road at Three Mile Harbor is tremendous. One of the best places to look to see where the traffic is coming from is at the intersection of Floyd Street. Because then you get to see where it's, Floyd Street is a big confluence there. You have everyone coming down Queens, at Queens Lane. Spinner, and then you can see where people come down Queens, which is a cutoff. If you drive up and down Springs Fire Place Road right now, you're going to be stopped two, if you're lucky, maybe three times based on the construction project. Um, but what you also get to see is it's get to see the people coming down town, town, town lane. And a lot of people are coming down town lane right now simply because the traffic outside of town hall here. I mean, I got backed up going to East Hampton Village yesterday past the old Christides. You know, but you know that that far back past um, Skim Hampton, it's it it backs up. So people are heading that direction to to get out of traffic. So it was put there, you know, for a a, a, a calm, to have a calming effect. But again, it, 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 there is a buildup. I've seen it one or twice where it's close to like number sixty nine, uh, closer to the bars this lane. But for the majority of times, I don't see it that much. I can understand the changes in the neighborhood. Uh, when we had this public hearing, the, one of the things I, I want to make sure is I would love to go back and get a weight limit put on to Akabonic Road. And I think that's appropriate in the residential area because now what you're seeing is a lot more, uh, you're seeing a lot of 18-wheeler uh, trucks going up and right. down Akabonic where there never used to be any. So a weight limit might be appropriate. There is that section of the code we can go after, but I think it's going to be multi-layering, working with other municipalities, find out about that section but overall uh it, it, it the plan was for a calming effect now if you remove that stop sign everyone's just going to keep speeding down akabonic uh so it's it, yeah, you know, think, six and one six, six, half dozen another right now you might have another I think, uh you know potentially moving to a three-way stop sign could work but you know the the other thing that was discussed was making collins a one-way <clears throat> and you know you also have hook mill road which is kind of underutilized and there may be a way of you know diverting some of the traffic on the hook mill road rather than collins making i mean you could make it a no left turn on the collins and have them northbound turn on hook mill road and that might alleviate some of the issue as well yeah, except that the visibility of hook mill to Three Mile uh, Harbor is terrible. That's all true. Hook Mill turning on. To North Main, you know, I guess. Yeah, North Main. I mean, you're pulling out where the trestle is, but you, you wouldn't want to make a left turn there. That's yeah. where the right. sign of issue is. Making the right turn, though, Yeah. Um, there's not really a, an issue with making mm -hmm. the right turn. Yeah, no, but sometimes so, it backs up to, to 27. Um, because of the light at Collins. I, I, there's, yeah, obviously there's a, a lot to think about there. Um, I do have a question of, regarding, so we had that public hearing for Collins on May 7th. So like we've had 15 public hearings since May 7th. Um, we, six transcripts have been posted. Five of them we've closed and voted on last Thursday. 
So there's still a, a, a number of um, public hearings that haven't even gotten transcripts up yet. And I uh, was just wondering what the status of that was. We haven't done, you know, fences, gates, pillars, and walls. We haven't done the, the music permit. And, um, you know, there's a, a number of other, um, yeah, you know, Piro sewer district. I mean, there's a number of things that are, aside from the stop sign at Collins, that's still outstanding. And is there, do we know when we're going to be ready to post those um, public hearings, transcripts? I was focused on the, you know, the ZBA hearings and the ARB hearings, but it seems like that solution should uh, work for the town board hearings as well. We, we have the, uh, you know, we have the uh, company that can do it and we've been getting up to speed on those. So I don't know why we can't uh, get that for the town board. I think board we'll have hearing. to double check with the attorney's office. I can reach to out to uh, if they, John if they've been posted, you know, and if not, why not? And yeah. uh, again, we should be tracking the time on that. Two weeks after posted, uh, they we can close them. And so I expect, you know, the next regular meeting we'll have a number of those prepared to close. But well, we can't though. There, there are only there are only six posted. Five we voted on. The other one that's up there is the CCA, which we've agreed to leave open until we could have right. another public hearing in person. So there's there's nothing left up there that to that we can close. Everything's been acted on, or is still you know we agreed to keep open. Right. So those need to. Oh, be oh okay. So. So, so we're not but there are nine that haven't been posted yet. That you know, okay. starting okay. with May seventh. Uh, okay. I can, um, I know that David at, reached out to me, so I'm ordering the transcript for the Akabonic Collins Avenue stop sign because he asked me to do it, but there might just be a sort of a breakdown in communication in terms of who thinks, who else is responsible for ordering them. It is a little bit of a I, I thought we, we have to. Every everyone has to be ordered. I mean, yeah. I, no, I understand that, but who is who thinks who is responsible for ordering them? Is it the attorney that drafted the legislation, or I, I, I think is, that's up up to the attorney's office to decide how you're going to handle that. But I, okay. I thought we had resolved that, um, and I think Jeff, you would, you had said that you would follow up with the posting of all the transcripts for for public hearings. Yeah, well, at the time we were talking about. So I guess we still need to do that. Let's so let's let's make sure that gets done. Yeah. Uh, I, I do have a list of all the public orders. hearings. We get the Anderson, I'll, I'll talk work. to John tomorrow, and we'll keep you in the loop. And let's let's just fix it. And get okay. It. Yep. Okay. We'll probably just have to dedicate, you know, an afternoon. Yeah. To okay. Scribby, no problem. Then, okay. Thanks. And then uh, you know, coming up with a system so that we don't have this issue again. Okay, any other comments uh, on the, I guess we're done with Berryman. We have the, the board member support stop sign there. We'll draft a resolution schedule of hearing for that. And uh, hopefully by then the transcript posting will be all figured out. <clears throat> we have um, anyone on the, anyone on the line? Any callers, Michael, calling in? No, there are no callers on the line. Okay. All right, thank you. I'm going to stop the screen share. Can bring it up. Okay, so we're up to uh, liaison reports. Kathy, you have a liaison I do, report? I do. I, you know, as always, Human Services Department is ready to provide assistance to seniors and other community members in need. Their phone number is 631-329-6939. They continue to make their weekly wellness calls, deliver their uh, prepared meals, the frozen meals to our seniors. And today they're actually having a, a dry run for um, a Zoom uh, session with the folks that participate in the adult daycare program. What they're looking to do is resume um, on, resume on Zoom, how do you like that? Uh, with the, the participants of adult daycare, you know, every morning and, um, you know, as far as the time, how long that program will last, 
you know, basically, I think that'll be dictated by um, how comfortable uh, the seniors are with, you know, sitting in front of the computer and, and participating. I've asked uh, Diane Patrizio to reach out to IT to get them uh, their own Zoom account because they were going to try to use free Zoom. And I was like, no, 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 that only limits you to 40 minutes. You need to get a real Zoom account. So um, they're gonna work on that. And then we continue to deliver, you know, groceries, prescriptions and other essentials to seniors that need to um, have those services. We just ask that they use a vendor that, a merchant that has uh, prepaid phone orders. Um, the next thing I wanted to bring up, I don't typically respond to um, editorials that appear in the newspaper, but there was an editorial in the paper last week that talked about uh, that there's a great need out here for psychological services. And, you know, obviously we, we know that the stresses brought on by COVID are causing fear, anxiety, loneliness, and despair for some folks. And this can you know, lead to mental health issues or alcohol and, and drug abuse and family violence. Um, the article did mention that there is, a, you know, um, a provider, we have the retreat, we're blessed to have uh, their services out here and they do a lot. Not only do they have their residential program, but they have a lot of services for, um, for outpatient uh, counseling services, attorney services. They also do have a tremendous educational program and they're still operating remotely. You know, their 24 hour hotline is 631-329-2200 and folks, you know, should uh, be encouraged to call if they need their services and support. What wasn't mentioned in the article were two other programs that are right here in East Hampton and that the first one is Family Service League. You know, uh, they are, they never stop servicing clients when, um, you know, the pandemic, you know, and everything shut down. They were still uh, seeing clients. They were using telehealth, which is, you know, a secure system. They're actually starting to bring some clients in this week to have face-to-face uh, -face sessions. Uh, they do group sessions. Um, and you know, they have so many programs that are operating in East Hampton that I think that, you know, folks may not be aware of. So um, I took the lead, I hope you don't mind, and invited uh, Family Service League if they'd like to come to a work session and present, you know, what they do at their clinic, you know, what they're doing with the, you know, the South Fork Behavioral Health Initiative, which was initiated in around 2014, 2015, when you know, uh, Adam Fine and Ralph Naglieri from the high school had sounded the alarm that there was a need for services, particularly for our young people. And, you know, as they say, we've come a long way, baby. You know, we've, you know, through those funds, the town contributes, school districts, the state has put, you know, over half a million dollars into that program since its inception. And it expanded the, um, the, the providers at Family Service League, including bilingual providers. It also had, has telepsychiatry at the high school and uh, at Family Service League. They have a full-time uh, psychiatrist there that can prescribe medication for those folks that need it. They have a child psychologist that comes in a couple times a month. Um, so they, then they had, uh, you know, an adolescent social worker who was in the high school seeing students there um, you know, Padlas for Humanity, who, you know, as Councilman Lee knows, has, you know, a huge um, contributor to programs to help for mental health services, particularly for our kids. Uh, they've donated uh, a sizable amount of money for Family Service League to have a program in the spring school where bilingual social workers would come in and families could make appointments and, and have services right there at the school. You know, and there's so many other programs that they are operating. And, um, you know, I was disappointed, I have to say, that they weren't mentioned um, in the editorial. And then there's Phoenix House, an another program that the town gives grant money to that helps people that are, um, you know, in recovery. And they provide essential services, whether that's, you know, group services, individual family counseling. So, you know, those are two programs that, um, you know, we're, 
uh, our human services department uh, recommends to you know community members. For instance, we're even over the summer we're getting recommendations from social workers at the high school. They call up Liliana at, at Human Services to say that they've got a student that's in distress. We also have pediatricians recommending uh, to Human Services and, and things, you know, they're directed to call Family Service League. And there's no wait time for those folks. And um, we had a psychiatrist pass away that there were clients that were, you know, in flux as far as how did they get their medication monitored and Family Service League stepped up there. So I just, you know, felt a need to share with the community the tremendous value that these programs add and, and because these are tough times. The other thing I want to point out is in the editorial, it mentioned uh, that folks could call the county but unfortunately they gave the wrong number for the county. The county number is 311. That's the um, hotline number that you can call. It's the same number of folks that are food insecure call and the town you know, human services department delivers um, food to uh, folks that are in need. So I, I just uh, felt the need to, to make these comments so that folks know that we do have resources here. We have Family Service League, their number is 631. 324-3344 and Phoenix House on Spruce Fireplace Road, their number is 631-329-0373. And again, they can reach out to Human Services at 631-329-6939. Um, and then lastly, um, you know, Tom McMorrow got on the call, you know, on our meeting last week to talk about the census. Um, you know, right now, the participation across the country is 63%. In New York State, it's 59%. And in East Hampton, it's 30%. So the Census Bureau is going to be doing what they're calling a mobile questionnaire assistance, where they want to go to places where um, community members, I don't want to use the word congregate, but where there's a lot of foot traffic. And um, so they can go to farmers markets or food pantries, grocery stores, uh, churches. So I think, you know, the, um, the census committee will be brainstorming, you know, how to further push this out and, and work with the census in order to possibly, you know, get them a table at the farmer's markets and, and it, um, maybe there's something that we can put. I know we've been using food pantries to disseminate information. I've also asked Diane Patrizio to now include it uh, when they make the weekly calls to our seniors, which is, you know, a couple of hundred every week to make sure they've, you know, responded to the census. So, you know, we're going to continue to push this since the new cutoff date is September 30th. Yeah, so Kathy, so. That, that truly is an important thing that we need to try and get better involvement with here. I know Steve Collins, the partnership specialist with the New York region uh, area of the census uh, has reached out and, and I think we can, uh, we can work together to try and prove that uh, really uh, concerning statistic. Um, it is so absolutely important that we get everybody in the community counted, counted regardless of what their status might be because it, it affects everything from our ability to secure grant funding to um, as well have representation in Congress and um, everybody needs to participate in that. It's, it's so crucially important. So thanks yeah. for bringing that up. Yeah, what's so I, ironic is that I respond, I, you know, I, you know, we have uh, mail gets delivered to our home. So I, I, we got the postcard mm -hmm. with the number took me less than 10 minutes to do the survey, but I've since gotten two, two phone calls asking if I had done the, the census yet. So it was, it's, um, yeah, it's kind of surprising that we don't is. have better, you know, participation. It's really, it's really surprising, frankly. Um, yeah, I just, but, but, but I, I sent it out to, um, well, I got a new brochure from Ola that did it in Spanish and English and sent that to um, the anti-bias task force so that they could distribute it as well. Um, Cause we do have several um, people that are either reverends for churches. And so they could mm -hmm. help with, you know, that group as you were talking about Kathy, you know, where people gather 
um, to, to fill it out, to understand what they need to do. And, um, you know, educators are on that committee. So uh, hopefully, you know, we're trying our best to get this out there so people can be counted. And it's important that people are counted. Absolutely. Thank you. That's what I have for today. And it takes uh, very little time to do it. Um, right. You know, you can go online and, and fill out the census and just look up the 2020 census on the internet. And you, yep. we'll tell you how to get there. Um, and also, Kathy, I'm glad you, you pointed out the mental health services that are available within the town with various organizations. And, um, you know, that's so important. And I know you, you were heavily involved early on uh, with the, the high school, with uh, Adam Fine and, and Ralph Naglieri and mm -hmm. putting together a response to uh, issues that, that are, were a great concern um, following, um, you know, suicide and, and whatnot. And to, to really reach out to address um, mental health concerns. I know one of the issues was that, uh, you know, if you had someone who was having an issue, they had to be uh, under the existing protocols, they had to be literally handcuffed and taken to Stony Brook. And so, you know, that was a completely unacceptable response in those situations. And uh, thankfully that has, uh, that has been resolved and there's a better way of dealing with that. So I appreciate all your work on that. Well, thank you, Peter. And again, the, the county number for folks that want to reach out is 311. Thanks. Uh, David, do you have a liaison report for us? Yeah, I do. I just, just to follow up with Kathy, discussing the census, we discussed it at our ACAC meeting last night um, about, this, about the census and it's almost, I honestly, this is a little bit of a shame on us out here. You know, the numbers are, you know, Kathy stated New York State's 59, the uh, United States is 63 percentage. You know, we're at 30 percent. Southampton, 37, South Old, 37.6, and Riverhead, 57 percent response rate. Uh, it's really important. Uh, you might not feel it now, but you'll be feeling this, you know, eight to 10 years from now when we have to look for any type of funding uh, moving forward from the state or the federal agencies that we don't recognize how much we do get. So it's extremely important. And in a phase, or which the, the, the enumeration phase has been decreased. So Kathy, I thank you for bringing it up. And I think it's important for get the word out as much as possible. It's a very, very easy thing to do. I implore upon everyone. Um, and that's gonna end on September 30th. So the time is really running short. So yeah, people need to get on board. <laughs> exactly. So uh, to go back into ACAC, uh, our, we had an Amagan CAC meeting last night. It was a nice meeting. Uh, I want to thank uh, the guests of the chair of the Wayne Scott CAC uh, was there last night. Mostly the discussion uh, surrounded around uh, mail delivery in the Amagans area, ways to either petition for that or uh, try to move forward with that. Uh, they're going to look to potentially announce um, very shortly having an open uh, discussion to all the residents at, uh, for, of Amagans and not just the CAC via a Zoom link to discuss mail delivery pros and cons and options moving forward at our next meeting on September 14th. When I have the information, I'll pass it along and we will get that out. Uh, one of the discussion points was how do you get information out there? And uh, what, uh, one of the discussions came to mailings, uh, it's called an EDDM, Every Door Direct Mailing, uh, which for Amy Gans, it, you know, it's certain cost to it, it's low under five dollars. There was a question to see the town board would support that. Uh, I'll email that to the board later. Um, and then uh, just n normal concern, uh, concerns uh, um, that we had in Amagans that pretty much uh, uh, in, in the age of COVID right now, school, uh, schools, how our school can be open re uh, safely right now, social distancing and such thing too. Um, but I thank everyone that joined us at our meeting last night. Um, I wanted to continue to let everyone know and uh, uh, sanitation right now uh, is extremely important, particularly now. I know uh, Sylvia, uh, Sylvia sponsored legislation last year about uh, updating the rental registry to put an additional caveat for refuse removal for, for rentals. Uh, and in August right now, and with, specifically with many people that might have used our recycling centers in the past, it's very important to, to separate your recyclables uh, the reason why I say that, if you put a plastic in with a tin, you could have a ton of tin not be able to be used anymore or recycled. Even though, as by Steve Lynch states that we have a very good rate of recyclables here and the clean recyclables, 
I implore everyone right now that might not be as knowledgeable or uh, as steady as making sure they very cleanly put the recyclables in the right containers to, to do so. so and I, I hope you do that. Um, let's see here. The Beach Advisory Group had a, had a e uh, string of emails this past week was uh, a little bit weather dependent. It was a little overcast on Saturday, got sunnier. Sunday was a nice day. Uh, many of the beach parking lots in the wills and Atlantic were closed down at capacity for, uh, for you know, two or three hours of the day. Uh, beach capacities were under uh, a decrease from last week, 60 to 70 percent for beach capacities based on uh, what the town lifeguards and Marine Patrol were seeing. We will continue to keep monitoring that. Uh, we are keep noticing uh, much more action on the beaches at night times after lifeguarded hours, either with individuals having their own private, uh, private gatherings down there. So we'll continue to request enforcement to get more uh, more boots on the sand down there and to look at that uh, those areas. Um, let me just go into, um, we did get a notice for SCALP, uh, Suffolk County uh, uh, Aquaculture Lease Program. There is an upcoming meeting of the 10 year review for Thursday, August 20th from 3 to 5 p.m. It's done by Zoom. You have to please contact Susan Flipowicz at Suffolk County uh, uh, to get yourself registered for that. If anyone wishes to participate in there, you must register in advance for that. And then lastly, what I have on here is uh, I sit. I can sit in, I listened in uh, to uh, the Water Quality Technical Advisory Committee meeting next week in which they were discussing uh, some, uh, some procedures moving forward, changes. I know we got uh, emails to the board about that, but I want to let everyone know that yes, uh, uh, Councilman Bragman put forward uh, the resolution last week for approval of the projects for round one of the 2020 Water and Qual uh, Quality Improvement uh, Program. That, that, uh, that round is complete, and the second round for 2020 is currently still open, but closes on August 20th for your consideration. The funding available is $500,000 this round. Please contact Melissa Winslow, Natural Resources Department at 324-0496 for an application or any information, but is open to all applicants. But again, any applicant that applied for the first round, that round is complete, but please feel free to apply again. And that's all I have. Thank you very much. Thank you, David. Sylvia? Yeah, I, I want to go back. And, and David, I know that ACAC has been talking about um, mail delivery. I, um, so there's a new app out called Informed Delivery that the United States Post Office has put together. So if you go and look up Informed Delivery, you can get the app. And it will have a picture of the mail that is delivered to your box. So it is then something you can click onto and you can see any packages that have been delivered, any mail from, you know, crazy stuff that you don't want to pick up <laughs> to the stuff that you want to make a, a trip to the post office to get. So it may help and it is uh, secure. Uh, and anyway, look it up. And I've started using informed delivery and it's very helpful, especially at this point when the lines are longer at the post office to know when to go, when not to go, what you're gonna find at your post office box. So I think for people in Amagansett, it's a, it's a great thing to use. Anyone that has a PO box. Thank is, you very much, I appreciate yeah. it. I right. it out. Yeah, informed delivery by USPS. So <laughs> just wanted to get that out there. <laughs> so, um, on August 17th, it's Monday from 12 to one, is the webinar about uh, CCA, which is Community Choice Aggregation, which is concerning um, our electric service choices that we can have and what type of electricity we receive from what types of sources. And if you would please register at energizeeh.org, um, you'll be able to um, join that webinar and also um, put your questions in before the webinar so that people that are there, there are three um, folks that are going to be there from NYSERDA is Brad Tito from Sustainable Westchester that's had this program now for several years, is Dan Welsh, and then from LIPA is Justin Bell. So they'll be able to answer all of your questions. And I will say, I know it came up today about, you know, having the second public hearing on CCA that it should take place when, you know, we can do this in person. 
So I don't know when in person is going to continue or, or going to start back. And I would um, encourage the town board to look at having the second uh, public hearing on CCA, particularly after this webinar has been up and people can also um, see it. Hopefully LTV is going to also um, record it. Um, that we have it regardless of whether or not we are in person. Because I think putting that um, and stopping CCA at this point in time because we can't have it in person it is, is, is really onerous. And I think we should consider making sure that people, um, you know, two public hearings on this, mm -hmm. I think is, is worthwhile and appreciate it, but would like to move it forward if we are not gonna be in session in person uh, anytime soon. I don't know how the rest of the board feels about that, but um, certainly I, I feel strongly that we need to move forward with CCA um, and have the think, public buy in. Yeah, I, I appreciate Before that, that, Sylvia. And I, and I think the important thing here is that it doesn't commit the town to anything. Uh, it's just enabling legislation. And uh, again, we have that um, uh, program scheduled for Monday the 17th at noon. You can sign up for it, learn, uh, learn about CCA and ask questions uh, that you might have about CCA. And, and I'm ready to move forward with that. I think can I ask a question yeah. about the webinar? Will it be, you know, filmed or whatever so that you, people can go back? Because obviously 12 to 1 Monday, it's a work day. So not everybody, if you're a working person, you probably can't you know, catch it at um, My understanding live. is that LTV is going to record it for okay. us so that they can um, hopefully then, you know, at LTV, you can tune in whenever you need to tune in. Yeah, I, I think that'll be really helpful for anyone who has questions or concerns about CCA to better understand what it really means. And again, we're talking about enabling legislation, not right. committing the town or the town's people to any uh, kind of change, just making right. Uh, and our the west. ability to do so at a future point should we go in that direction right our neighbors to the west have already done enabling legislation including southampton and brookhaven so you know i think um we we certainly won't be in the forefront with this process but i, I it would be nice the larger the pool that of, of people that opt in is um you know, important as far as, as pricing goes, like anything else. So I think it's it's important that we that we try to move this forward. Um, I support it. I just want to jump in and say that I have been supporting it for a couple yeah. of years now, and we are a little bit lagging behind. It is only enabling legislation; doesn't commit us. So we should we should move this forward. And uh, the two hearings are great, and I'm glad to see it uh, a consensus in that direction. All right, thanks. Thanks. I appreciate that, Jeff. I want to remind the board that um, folks that are interested, we will be discussing legislation for electric powered leaf blowers uh, next Tuesday. And it'll be during the work session. And uh, Lauren Steinberg, Gordian Rock will be, will be working on it. And we're still working on other speakers that may be able to chime in and help people understand Again, uh, we would be following Southampton Village and East Hampton Village who already have legislation in place for electric blowers. You know, there's, it's two-pronged attack. It's one about noise and it's also about, um, you know, using electric blowers uh, instead of uh, fossil fuels. Um, so, it, you know, we're going to look at that. Um, and the legislation is being recommended by the Energy Sustainability Committee. So it'll be the first time the town board has heard this discussion as well. So it, it'll be ongoing. I don't think it's gonna resolve itself. Um, it probably will take a couple of work sessions for us to work through it. And then to actually have our own legislation written so that we can see um, what it is. So all of you should have the recommendations from the Energy Sustainability Committee and um, the legislation from Southampton Village and East Hampton Village. That I don't um, the remember seeing. Did you, the Southampton and East Hampton, did that get sent around? If it didn't, I'll make sure it does. Okay, I, I got the memo, but I didn't get okay. the um, Okay. The legislation. I'll, I'll forward that to you too, thanks. Great, thank you. Um, Energy Sustainability Committee also sent me a letter. I just got it the other day and I'll send it on to the town board. Um, 
It's uh, encouraging the town board to act now, supporting the South Fork Wind Farm, known as Deepwater Wind. Um, it is clean power, and they feel that clean power is needed now. Um, I will say that the town and the trustees have been working for over two years now on an agreement with Orsted Deepwater and getting easements uh, for the wind farm. And I believe it's now time to act, sending um, this letter to all town board members will certainly, I hope, encourage you to consider acting um, in favor of easements as well. And uh, let's see, that's it for energy sustainability. Uh, the business recovery group also met, and I'm not sure if, um, Peter, you didn't give these statistics. They're now almost a week old because we'll meet again tomorrow. But Southampton has no patients right now uh, for COVID. Uh, the Eastern, um, uh, the hospital in Greenport, Eastern Regional, I think it's called, had one patient. Uh, Stony Brook had 17 patients and overall 36 patients in all hospitals in Suffolk County. So um, very proud of that number. And um, nobody, I, uh, I don't have the number of people that were in ICU, but I believe very few were in ICU. So I, you know, again, from the recovery, um, business recovery group's point of view, the worst thing that could happen um, to us is to have those numbers and that metrics go back up where we have to look at closure again, because that would be devastating to many of our local businesses. And we're really trying to encourage people to shop locally um, and get out there and support our local businesses, whether shopping or restaurants in a safe, socially distant, masked manner. Um, we also produced um, posters that are 11 by 17, that are being put into store windows and shops as um, you know, so people know that the town is behind these businesses, asking them to make sure that they're masked when they come in, that they stay socially distant. Um, and it, they can also then, the businesses can put the number of folks that they think should be in their premises at one time, depending on the size of the premises and how easy it is to stay, stay socially distanced from others. So I wanna thank the Chamber of Commerce in Montauk for helping us distribute those. Um, and uh, uh, we will have another meeting tomorrow. Uh, our meetings are always on Wednesday, uh, Wednesday morning. So I just wanna thank the Business Recovery Group for, for you know, again, their, their good works, their staying with this and their information that they're getting to us, the town board for help that they need. Um, and that's it. Sylvia, that's just to add, thank you, Sylvia. Just to add in the, the uh, answer to your question on ICU beds, there, there are only five in the entire county uh, COVID uh, patients in ICU at this time. So right. that's a remarkable turnaround. And uh, again, you know, we need to keep, keep things heading in that direction. Yeah. Oh, uh, the other statistic that I forgot, um, there had been as of last week, over a thousand um, COVID tests in Montauk alone, um, and that there were 11. So that people that were found positive. So that's a 1.1% rate. And um, hopefully that rate will be going no, no, down. Not 1.1%. It's, it's less it's, than that. It's less than that out of 11 yeah, out of 1,100. Yeah. Sorry. Um, so I just, again, I think those are, those are really good numbers. Um, and those are the type of numbers we want to see as the infection rate continues or the, um, yeah, the infection rate continues to go down. I think New York state now is the lowest state in the nation for the infection rate. Oh yeah. Let's keep at it folks. Right. Good job everyone. Thank you, Sylvia. Uh, yep. Jeff, do you have a GSR report for us? Yeah, I just want to say that's pretty remarkable for New York since we were the epicenter as of March 8th. But I want to just say one thing as a caution, and that is on March 8th, I believe it was March 8th, we had our first COVID case detected. Within 30 days, we had 10,000 cases. Mm -hmm. So things can get out of hand pretty quickly. Yeah, I agree. Uh, we're, we're doing a good job, but we got to keep doing a good job. But I'd rather hear those numbers than other numbers. Absolutely. 
I have a shorter liaison report today because uh, reported extensively from Wayne Scott last week. I'm work I've been working uh, on airport issues, um, one of which was that we had some inquiries from uh, members of the public who wanted to know what our uh, policies were on COVID in terms of the um, uh, quarantining and contact tracing, and Jim Brundage was uh, helpful and provided a summary, so we sent that around and referred people to where it is on the website, and we're in good shape on following the governor's uh, orders, and uh, AMAC is, we're between uh, airport management advisory committee meetings, so I have nothing to report there. Uh, likewise, I've been working with the Housing Authority on some legal issues, which I think we're close to resolving, but they're not ready for prime time discussion. I just wanted to talk about, very briefly, about Wayne Scott Green. Uh, Kathy, there, there is a proposed event tomorrow that I just found out about. It's a poetry reading with less than 50 people proposed on the Wayne Scott Green. I had sent them to Gabrielle and said, you got to get a special... Uh, a, a special permit for that. Um, but uh, as long as I'm doing a liaison report, I'm not uh, uh, enthusiastic about having a, uh, an event on the green, which has not even been opened yet. I just don't think it's a great idea. I wanted to hear what the board felt about it. I mean, I know it's a vacant piece of land, but I just to err on the side of caution. I think it's probably premature to be scheduling an event. So I wanted to ask how the board felt about that. And so Jeff, wouldn't this require a gathering permit? Yes, I, I think it would. So has the committee reviewed it? I mean, normally the, the committee reviews these things. Yeah, no, I, I, I actually gave the, I passed along Gabriella's contact information and just got a note, oh, we're having this event. And I, I just emailed back and said, well, you know. What, what is that's this not, event? That's not it, our it's, a, it's a very low, low, low key, event but it's they, they need to get a special event permit but, but what I don't, is the event low key it is a it is a poetry reading so it's it's a calm and so normally when people uh, are required to get a permit for an event uh yeah. the process is they submit that to the committee the committee reviews it and they give us them yes uh, that is the normal permit. process right. and you have to so, you have to you know do a whole whole harmless and yeah things so, like that so I understand. So i'm just why, i'm just giving you notice we, no, I'm just asking why would we why would we diverge from that process in this case? Well, yeah, I, well, the issue I was really asking about was I, I don't think I think until the green is finished, we shouldn't be posting. Well, if there's two different things, there's the green yeah. being finished, and then there's the process for gathering permits on town property. Yeah, I've sounds already like, gotten back. Sounds to that. like neither one is 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 in alignment. Well, yeah. I don't know. Somebody's very Correct. enthusiastic about that. Well, they, they, they called Gabriella and they were going to be submitting an application this afternoon. We don't typically, we can't turn things around that quickly. Yeah, and uh, or, or less. It was a surprise to me. They, and they had Gabriella's name for easily a week. I mean, we, we, so we usually week require a, what, two weeks notice yeah. or 30 days on larger events? Yeah. yeah. And we also nowadays too, when we get um, applications, we, we check with the town attorney's office to make sure that it's allowed under the um, New York State so guidance. Yeah, okay. Yeah. That sounds good. I'll just make sure they understand that. The other thing is I passed around some information about moving a telephone pole. David had mentioned this a uh, number of weeks ago. It, it's, it's actually a part of the project for the Wayne Scott Green that is in a later phase. Um, and uh, I don't see it. Peter, you had asked for something. Yeah, I, I asked, I never, I don't think I got a response to my questions. I was wondering where on this site, if you could just send a copy of the site plan or survey showing where it is and why. Yeah, we're, we're working. As to we're why it would need to be moved. Yeah, we're working on that, but I don't think it should hold up the, the main work, which is the parking and the, and the pathway. So we're, we're working on getting you that. It information. seemed like it was rather expensive. And so I was trying to understand if, yeah, it's on, if it's on the CPF property, uh, you know, we, can CPF funds pay for its removal? Um, or, you know, is it in the road right of way? I, that's why I was asking if you could right. show we're, us, share with us where it's located, and then we can. Right. We are working on that, and we can revisit the issue, but I've also uh, talked to Steve Lynch, and 
he's moving forward with uh, being able to actually proceed with the other work as to which the board has expressed a consensus that we move forward. That would be the pat, the walkway and the parking. And I think that's what we need to have. Do we need to cutting. do a resolution to hire the, um, the person to do the work? Yeah, we will. Uh, I just talked to Steve yesterday. I'll find out what the All right. So, in, you know, we look forward to seeing that resolution prepared and submitted, and we'll have it up for a vote. Okay. I think All right, that's, that's, I think everybody's pretty been pretty supportive of the of the plan and to try and get it done. So yeah. we're and that's, that's really what I have today. Okay. Thank you, Jeff. Um, well. You know, there are a couple things we, we talked about um, in our first topic today, the, the um, financial condition of the town. And, and again, I'm, I'm very pleased to, to say that we have received reaffirmation of the town's AAA bond rating, which is the highest bond rating a municipality can receive. And apparently the only problem was there wasn't a triple, a quadruple A uh, which the town could receive because apparently we would qualify for that if it was. And again, I want to thank, you know, our excellent finance staff, our, our budget officer, Len Bernard, Charlene Cagle, our uh, chief financial officer. And, um, and really just talk a little bit about it. it's budget time now. Um, I've been having, holding budget meetings with all the departments and that that process will be over the next two weeks and I'll be preparing a budget uh, to bring to the board and that'll be submitted, uh, has to be submitted by September 30th, uh, every, every year. And, uh, sometime between the 25th and the 30th, I'll have that budget ready for you to start reviewing. We'll have a hearing, uh, on the budget no later than November 5th. And it needs to be adopted by law again by November 20th. We could do it before that timeline, but it looks like November 5th, because of the gap in meeting dates uh, between the end of October and the date of the 5th, that actually November 5th falls on a Thursday. So we'll schedule November 5th as the public uh, notice uh, on that. Um, we had additionally some really good news that just came through today. As you may know, we had a bond sale uh, for borrowing uh, 15 year bonds. Uh, we. We had a total of 12.9 million. We got a rate of 0.907%, which is, yeah, under 1%, which is really groundbreaking, wow. uh, according to Anthony Nash and Rich Tatora, who are uh, taking care of the bond sale for us. It's the lowest rate that Anthony's ever seen in 15 years of municipal bonding. So again, uh, kudos to everyone for working together to keep the town's finances in solid shape. And again, keep in mind, this is during a pandemic. So I think it's a really good showing for us. Um, and I appreciate all of your support. We passed budgets and conservative budgeting. Um, we had uh, just under 500,000 in bonding for water main hookups relating to the Wayne Scott Water Supply District, that's 20 year bond. Uh, we got 1.84% on that, which is really excellent for taxable bonds in a small quantity like that. Um, for the 5.3 million uh, in a one year note, <clears throat> we got a 0.336%. And yes, that's one third of a percent. And then callable notes, which is 1.6 million plus for the manor houses, which are callable three months. Uh, afterwards there, we got a rate of 0.93%. Uh, so really good news on our bond sale. Um, that puts us in, in really good situation for keeping our, our debt service low. Um, last Tuesday, we experienced ECIS, that tropical storm that came through. And, uh, you know, we were really spared the brunt of it out here. We were very fortunate. We did not ha have a lot of damage and uh, there were not a lot of power outages. I think it was somewhere around 50 or so. That was the good news. Um, the bad news is that we still have 36 customers without power. And with over 340,000 customers on Long Island out, of power as a result of that storm initially uh, because we have a few scattered 
outages. Uh, PSEG has really been prioritizing critical infrastructure. They did help us get our communications tower um, off backup generator, emergency communications tower, uh, very quickly. But because uh, they prioritize based on the number of folks out, uh, they're focusing on those high uh, concentration areas. They still have not resolved uh, issues for some of our residents. I spent a good part of the weekend back and forth with PSEG trying to answer uh, constituents about what the status of their own outages were. Um, and that was with uh, mixed results. Uh, some of the folks were got back on pretty quickly and others, um, as I said, are still currently out. We certainly hope that PSEG will be able to concentrate on those folks and get everybody back up and running. Um, certainly points out just how dependent uh, we are and how we need to become a little more resilient. This was not a hurricane. Uh, it was a major storm for most of the island, but uh, our vulnerabilities are, are you know, exposed at times like these. I think uh, having a more resilient way of getting power is important to, to strive for over time, especially being so far out here on the island. Uh, we had um, an emergency permit was granted by the DEC to the Friends of Georgica Pond uh, to allow the Georgia Pond harvester to remove um, mats of um, algae that have pretty much completely choked off Georgica Cove. Uh, there was a uh, blue-green algae cyanobacteria outbreak there. Uh, as the board knows, that, that uh, cyanobacteria does cause health issues for animals and humans alike. Uh, so it's important to keep that in check. Um, so that work will be uh, ongoing. Uh, the board had earlier passed a resolution, which is still in effect, to allow for the use of the harvester under emergency conditions and with approval of the DC. Um, Sylvia did mention a um, letter from the Energy Sustainability urging that we move forward with uh, offshore wind. I just wanted to bring the public up to date that we have been in negotiations for several years with Orsted over community host benefits agreement and easements to allow for the landward transmission of cable. We're getting very, very close to reaching an agree agreement and agreeable terms for that. Uh, and I expect uh, in the coming weeks, we'll be able to have an open discussion about what that, those agreements are and release that information uh, to the general public and uh, move forward with discussions from there. And at this point, I believe we're ready to do resolutions. Great. So we've got resolution 2020-790. It's approval of two special warrants. One is for the New York State DEC. It's a consent order in the amount of $327,186.01. And the second is for CPF uh, for a property, uh, 395 Panago. Uh, in the amount of $6,988.32. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Passed and carried. Excuse me, Mr. Supervisor, if I may. There is a caller on the line. I didn't know if you wanted to. Yeah, we have it. one more resolution, Mike, and then we'll get to the caller. Thanks. Sorry. Just to be a moment. I have resolution 2020-791. This is the point of seasonal lifeguard, Kate Nye, of the hourly rate of $15 per hour, effective. August 12th, 2020. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Passed and carried. Uh, Michael, you have a caller on the line? Yes, I do. I'll be unmuting them right now. Hello? Hi. Good afternoon. Who's calling? Good afternoon. It's I, I'm surprised you didn't recognize my voice. It's Rona Klotman from Amagansett. Oh, Rona, do you recognize um, it now? Uh, I, I watched uh, the liaison report of David Lease from our meeting last night at ACAC, and uh, I was hoping he'd be more emphatic about the need of Amagansett to have mail delivery, and in order to do that, we need the town board 
uh, to uh, give ACT Act money so we can put flyers in all of the mailboxes uh, announcing our September 14th meeting on Zoom that we can discuss with the community um, having mail delivery. And uh, in order to do that, we need like 300, I think David said $358. And we were hoping the town board would contribute that uh, as a community effort for safety. Uh, uh, we did a resolution last night, and it passed unanimously. We had about 18 members on, on the call, on the Zoom call. So uh, I thought it would be up for discussion today because our next meeting is September 14th, and we would like to get those flyers in the mailbox uh, before that in preparation for the meeting. So I, Rana, I thought I'd maybe the board... Be happy, I'd be happy, Rona, to, to, to have the topic discussed at the next work session. Great. I also that think it needs great. to be researched by the town attorney's office to see if we can use um, taxpayer money for an effort like this, because I'm not sure that that. No, I'm, not sure. I'm not that sure either, and I'm also not I'm not sure what the process is with the Postal Service to uh, actually get home delivery, but I think it's something we could certainly take up and discuss. Well, it's an if Jameson could add that to her list. I'm sorry, Rona, what did you say? I said it's really a safety issue for the entire community. And if you ever stood online waiting for a package, uh, you would hear all of the complaints of the people uh, about wanting mail delivery. So we thought as a community effort uh, that ACAC, which represents the community, should really be talking about it. Um, as a total community, you can tune in to Zoom and be a part of our, you know, our discussion about having uh, postal delivery. And we don't know how to reach all of the people. We thought putting flyers and, uh, of course, doing a Maybe press a release for the, the post office. What's that? Maybe a poster up the post office if they'll allow you to put, put a uh, flyer up there. Yeah, no, I, I don't this know. Is not, this is not a unique situation to Amagansett either. I know, I know that uh, all across the country in Long Island, there's issues with the Postal Service trying to keep up, given the huge volumes that are being experienced in in mail. And Montauk also has, uh, you know, issue of uh, many of the residents there do not get home delivery. Also, and, and so that. And that creates, uh, you know, a large number of people who are trying to get packages or mail to and from the uh, local post offices. So, is Montauk uh, and Wayne Scott an, an issue for the residents, or is it a total they don't get mail delivery like Amagansett? Yeah, they don't get mail delivery, but the post office in Montauk is, you know, it's been overwhelmed. I've had a number of uh, constituents reach out and say, you know. Um, that the mail, they don't have enough staff and resources to process the mail and get it out to, to uh, residents, in, you know, in a timely manner. Even here in, in, in Town Hall, uh, some earlier on, we were receiving requests for permits via the mail, and sometimes it was 18 days from the postmark to the time it was actually delivered. The system was completely overwhelmed there for a while. It may be improving somewhat, and that's why we decided not to mail back permits that we have a pickup tent out at town hall so you can process have your permits process and then deliver to you at your car uh, when you drive in because uh, mailing them back could take another several weeks we thought and um, so you know this is not a, well, a unique I, problem i don't know what montauk and wayne scott are doing but amagansett wants to take a step forward and see if we can get mail delivery. We have a petition set to go. Uh, there will be people volunteering at the post office with the petition. We also want to get the flyer in the mailboxes, and that's what we need the money for. Uh, whatever it costs to uh, mail, you know, put a flyer in e each of the mailboxes, I think David Lee said $358, something like that. Uh, I mean, we haven't really gotten a definitive figure, but we would like to get 
mail delivery started I, in Amagansett. I, I, I can understand that and I, and I can appreciate that. And that seems like a, a, a noble effort. And I think we'll just have to, you know, do a little bit more research on our end, Rona, first of all, to see. That's great. Well, you know, if you that... discuss... Yeah, if you'll discuss it at Tuesday's meeting, that would be uh, great. And then we can resolve uh, that the town uh, might pay for the uh, putting the flyers into each of the mailboxes. Yeah, we'll, we'll take a ethics. look at that, Rona, and, and uh, we'll have a discussion at, at, at a minimum uh, during liaison reports. I think part of the discussion has to be whether or not, as Rona said, all of Amagansett wants to have this mail delivery because that is not my feeling at all in my neighborhood. So, you know, I think that a discussion is always good to be had. Um, ACAC has certainly had these discussions in the past, but I, I wouldn't want to say, you know, wholesale that this is exactly what everybody in Amagansett wants. I think that's misrepresentation. Well, okay. Sylvia, that's exactly why we want to have the Zoom meeting and uh, and put it out there uh, to get people's opinions. Because just to sit around your house and say, "Oh, my neighbors don't want it," I mean, if you go to the post office, that's not what you hear at the post office. And if you've yeah. experienced long lines at the post office in this time, which is in time of COVID, you, you're you're ready to get mail delivery. So, Thank you, Ron. Um, the only reason it wasn't just, as emphatic as you wanted is because, as I've stated last night, there might be a legal requirement we had to look into, and that's exactly what Councilwoman Burke Gonzalez said. There's things we have to look into before yeah, that. That's, that's, we we uh, we would appreciate you looking into it. That would be fine. Um, yeah, I'm not you know, sure because, that the town's uh, ever given any mo any funds to a CAC to do anything. Yeah, so, uh, I, that's I, right. Um, the CAC is there to advise the, the town. Board. To the town, and if the CAC advises well, that you know citizens want uh, you first, know home delivery, then... well, Peter, there's a first for everything, and uh, <laughs> this is a different well, time. Not always. This there's is not a always a first for everything. <laughs> huh? But we'll look into it. We appreciate you taking the time to call us, and we'll, we'll have a look into it. Thank you. Great. I look forward to the meeting. Michael, do we have any other callers on the line? We do. I will be unmuting the next caller right now. Good afternoon, uh, members of the uh, town council and Mr. Supervisor. How are you? This is Dave Buddha. Hi, David Buddha. How are you, sir? Good. First, I just wanted to let you know, I'm sure you appreciate to know that there are some people that hang on to the bitter end uh, of, and listen to most of your meetings so that there, you do have a, uh, a, a uh, audience out oh, wait, here. Wait, it's not that bitter. <laughs> <laughs> oh, number, number two, and this is only partially tongue-in-cheek, I think that instead of just having a uh, history quiz for some of your meetings, you need to have a math quiz, and I want to let you know that Sylvia <laughs> will win. And Peter, you will lose because her. <laughs> her you said 1.1%. Yeah. It's That's correct. 0. 11 1. out of 1,000 or so is 1.1%. <laughs> She's yeah. right. You're wrong. Well, well, my calculator, when I did the math, it said 0. 0.01. So <laughs> that didn't say 0. 0.01. You need to move one. the decimal yes, yes. point. Oh, okay. yes. and, and, well, it didn't, and, didn't and show the. Just, the zero one one. Let me just, so, okay. let me just remind you of the meaning of. Per Percent means one over a yeah. hundred. So thank, that's thank what percent means. Thanks for correcting me. You're right. percent. <laughs> I thought she said 1.1%. 1. 1 I'm pretty sure no, she no, said 1.1%. No. 1. 1%. I did. And now, okay. and now it's on to more, and now on to no, more, it's, now, right? now on to more, some more serious business. I yes. wanted to commend the board for authorizing your attorneys to pursue appropriate necessary legal action against the owners of the property in Montauk at uh, Ocean View Terrace. Um, it raises an interesting question because if you were to, from, from what I understand reading the pleadings which are now online on eCourts, the New York State um, court system now has required everything including uh, Article 78s to be posted online as and, and filed, all pleadings are filed online so that the public can 
watch the progress of, of a greater number of uh, legal cases that the town's involved in. One, I got the impression from reading the complaint that there were actions taken by the town ordinance enforcement or fire uh, marshal back in July and that the cases were simply disregarded and there was no appearance made and probably because um, the only named entity is the owner of the property and if you were to have access to the uh, state liquor authorities application submitted by that entity you'll find that there are a host of entities and people involved in the running of a modern uh, major hotel uh, motel which wants to be a uh, restaurant bar whatever that they're not entitled to that you need to have as a town an index and a requirement that there be a principal person for every commercial establishment so that you know who is responsible and that when the crap hits the fan that you know who are your appropriate defendants and parties that need to be notified and that can be hauled into court uh, if necessary. So that's my suggestion. Uh, you'll find that the entity that owns the property is not the people that are running the show and you're going to have you know, a host of problems with uh, jurisdiction because you've only named one entity as your defendant in that case. So that's my uh, suggestion and comment for today. Thank you, David. But Michael, do we have any other callers on the line? No, we don't oh, have sorry. any other callers. Still there, David? Yeah, yeah, yes, I, I'm sorry. Any I was just callers? finishing up by saying that I do, I do appreciate that um, the effort has been made to to use judicial resources to bear to hold people accountable for honoring and, and complying with the town uh, codes, zoning, health codes, fire codes, safety codes, et cetera. Thank you. Thank you, David. Appreciate your time. No one else will entertain a motion to go into exec session? Um, a motion to go into exec session for uh, Contracts, personnel, contracts, CPF, and CPF. CPF. It is now a quarter to two. Um, two thirty. Two thirty. Two thirty. Yeah. That worked for everybody. Yes. I'll, I'll send the link around. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Be safe. Stay well, everyone. Okay. Thanks. Bye now.